ये लाइव ये लाइव नो Shreya, please start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the galaxy of intellectuals, Your Excellency, respected judges, participants, and other friends. How different is this evening, dear audience? You will yourself discover as the colors of today's event unfold. They'll surely take us to another world. I, Shreya Gupta, first year student. of lhmc shall be the host of the evening i thereby extend a warm welcome to all of you to the national round of the event discourse an international debate competition the topic of today's debate is euthanasia is ethical why prolong painful existence this event has been organized by the student chapter of indian academy of geriatrics as part of the golden jubilee celebration of ucms new delhi we have both national and international partner organizations with us association of gerontology india medical education unit university college of medical sciences university of delhi the international network for the prevention of elder abuse inpea Sri Lanka Association of Geriatric Medicine (SLAGM), Universitas Respati Indonesia (URINDO), and Asian Asian Medical Student Association India (AMSA India). You don't win a debate by suppressing discussion. You win it with a better argument. The debate will only sensitize the students towards the needs of other persons. but will also help them think deeply about such topics at an early age in their medical career we believe debating is one of the best means to ignite a conversation and enable the participants to explore various challenges and ideas around issues i would like to quote your beautiful lines by joseph chubert it is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it with this note i proceed further now it's an honor to announce the judges of the event who will bring an incredible depth of experience and expertise to the table in judging our participants this evening we have with us dr alka ganesh shreya dr shreya please change your screens uh, your slides are not changing We have with us Dr. Alka Ganesh. Dr. Alka Ganesh retired as HOD of Internal Medicine Department at Christian Medical College, Bellore. She was instrumental in building a geriatrics department at CMC, which now offers a degree course in the subject. She she is also a proponent of family medicine. and serves on the specialty board for the nbe she she returned from cmc in 2009 and since then she is working in coimbatore as a geriatric consultant and trains candidates for the dnb and in medicine as well as uh, physician assistants thank you ma'am we are fortunate to have you here next we have dr anant bhan with us Dr Anand Bhan is a physician with a master's degree from the University of Toronto. He is a researcher in global health, bioethics and health policy. He is also adjunct professor Yenepoa deemed to be University Mangalore and adjunct faculty Kasturba Medical College Manipal. Dr Anand is immediate past president of International Association of Bioethics. thank you sir we are glad 
to have you here. Next, we have Dr. N. N. Prem. Dr. N. N. Prem is currently the chief consultant of geriatric medicine, elder care specialist at the Slow Hospital, Mumbai. He is also the chief consultant and believes in graceful living. His senior residency was at the Department of Geriatric Medicine, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and he continued there as an assistant professor. He is passionate about teaching, academ teaching academics and research to provide the best evidence-based care for the older persons. Thank you, sir. We are very fortunate to have you with us. Next, we have Dr. Satya Prakash. Mr. Sa Mr. Satya Prakash. Mr. Satya Prakash is the legal editor of the Tribune since Jan 2017. He has also worked as legal editor, associate editor of the Hindustan Times for a decade. Before joining HT, he headed the legal bureau of PTI, wherein he worked during 1996 to 2006. He has regularly appeared as an expert on politics and law on Rajya Sabha TV, Lok Sabha TV, Doordarshan and All India Radio in debates on issues of national importance. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to read out the rules and regulations. Yeah, please change your screen again. Now. Rules and regulations. Now, let me read out the rules and regulations given to the participants and the participants are requested to follow the same. Each team will be composed of two participants. One member will be required to speak for the motion and one member will be required to speak against the motion. Each team will be allotted a time slot. Both the teams, the team speaking and the interjecting team should be present at the given time slot. Teams will be called one by one. The order will be speaker for followed by rebuttal by the speaker against of a signed team, followed by speaker against, followed by rebuttal by speaker for of a signed team. The duration for each speaker shall be three minutes. An on-screen timer will be shown, which has a five second countdown to cue the speaker. Participants are requested to strictly adhere to the time limit. One minute will be given for each rebuttal. No more than one question will be asked. No cross-questioning is allowed. Any language that is considered inappropriate by the judges will lead to disqualification of the team. Participants are not allowed to tell the name of their respective colleges. Participants are also required to switch on their camera while speaking. The teams will be judged on the following criteria. Content, that is, facts presented to support their argument. Comprehension, based on the demonstration of understanding of the topic and information related to topic. Persuasiveness, based on how convincing and logical were the arguments placed by the speaker. Delivery, that is, manner of speaking. Communicating clearly, confidently, voice inflection and delivery rate. Last but not the least, rebuttal, based on how the speaker addresses their opponent's argument. So, um, I would like to mention here that our team, uh, one of the team's Tekken debaters had, has withdrawn its name from the competition. So, we will have slight changes. With this, I, uh, I, um, and now it's time to begin. So who's going to break the ice? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite our first team, Blitzkrieg, to share its views and opinions on the given topic. I also request the rebuttal team, Go Corona, Corona Go, 
to get ready for the questioning round. Hello. Hello. Yes, Vibha, you're audible. The right to life includes the right to live with dignity. But when there is unfathomable pain unto death, is there any dignity left? Good evening, everyone. I'm Vibha Hayke of Team Blitzkrieg, and I will be speaking for the topic. I believe that every patient should be responsible for their own life, including the right to take it. Terminal illnesses are no joke, usually accompanied with brutal pain, loss of motor function, or even cognitive decline. Prolongation of the patient's physical and mental suffering against their will is immoral. Moreover, every patient has the right to bodily autonomy, and taking away that right is unethical. There are several reasons for which people may seek out euthanasia. The two most common reasons being loss of autonomy and loss of disease-related disease symptoms. Um, in many terminal illnesses, the patient may be bedridden or may have to depend on someone else even to finish basic tasks. This, coupled with debilitating pain, will obviously take a toll both on the patient as well as the family. In a study conducted by the Journal of American Medicine, 73% of the participants, who were all terminally ill by the way, felt that euthanasia should be legalized and 58% of the participants felt that if legalized and if their symptoms became intolerable, they may personally make a request. Also, euthanasia already takes place illegally. In Mexico, the use of pentobarbital is ever prospering with people coming in from all over the world to the case here is that of Chantal Sabir, who was denied the right to die via euthanasia by the French government and was later found dead in her house with a pentobarbital overdose. Also, many people who seek out euthanasia usually do so because they've seen others die of the same disease, either within the family or within the hospital. They may not want to face the same fate or put their family through the process of a slow gory death. No matter what the standard of palliative care, there will always be cases wherein physical symptoms simply cannot be alleviated with the current technology that we have. Last but not the least, we consider it ethical for a patient to deny treatment or reject nutrition and hydration. We also consider it ethical for us to give opioid after opioid, even though we know it will hasten death or the patient's life is at risk. And yet somehow we consider it immoral for us to provide a peaceful death via euthanasia, even if the patient asked for it, even with informed consent. I would like to finish my um, stance by saying that we euthanize our pets no matter what they have when they are terminally ill. Why can't we give our own family members the same rights and choices? Thank you. Thank you so much. The rebuttal team. Hello, am I audible? And visible? Yes, you are. Okay, right. Um, how much time do I have to give the rebuttal? You'll be given one minute. Okay, I'll have full one minute. Um, no cross just, uh, question is allowed. Okay. So I'll and just finish in you one minute. You ask only one question. Okay, only one question. Okay. Yeah. Can you give me just 10 seconds? Sure. Right. Um, okay. Just set my timer. Okay, you you have the timer. Yeah, you 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 may start. So uh, I'll take the opposition's argument of autonomy. Right, number one, uh, right to autonomy is not right to autonomy is not absolute. Hence, for legitimate state interest, autonomy can definitely be curbed. Right. Secondly, the refusal of treatment actually is already legalized in India by the Supreme Court common cause judgment in 2008, a five judge constitutional bench has already told that a right to refusal of treatment will constitute a passive euthanasia and it's legalized like far back, right? The debate is about active euthanasia. My question to the, pro pro the proposition, proposition team is that there is a difference between 
uh, like let, letting the patient die, that is to say the patient refusing the treatment as compared to the patient asking the doctor or the doctor, man the doctor has a legal mandate to give the patient life ending medication. It's not just about that person alone. It's also about involving the whole medical professional and like the nurses and the doctors as well in their own request. How do you justify autonomy in that scenario? So you're asking me how I justify autonomy in a scenario where a patient requests to be euthanized. Is that what you're asking me? Um, no, I'm asking it's not just about the person letting him die. It's about the person also involving the doctor to kill him. Okay, 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 all right. Uh, so the thing about euthanasia is that only doctors who are ethically and morally okay with euthanasia would be asked to perform it. People like if a doctor cites that he has ethical or moral obligations with which don't allow him from performing euthanasia, then he doesn't have to, for starters. So even doctors are allowed that amount of autonomy. So I feel that even patients should be allowed the same amount of autonomy, wherein, you know, if they feel, if they give informed consent, by the way, and it's proof that they don't have any um, mental incapabilities which, um, which don't allow them from seeking euthanasia, in those cases, then yes, I feel that the patient should be given the same rights that we give our doctors if they say that they don't want to do euthanasia. And coming to, you know, you're saying that the right to euthanasia is not, it's not the final thing. I feel, I mean, according to the Indian Hippocratic Oath that I took, we said that, you know, um, we should allow our patients to make the ultimate decision about their own care. So I feel that no matter what, I am at least, at least at the very least morally obligated to ask, if the patient comes to me seeking euthanasia, at the very least morally obligated to ask them what they want, why they want it, if they've tried any palliative treatment, and if they have and it still has not worked to look for different options for them so that they can have a peaceful demise. Thank you. Wow, that was so great. Beautifully, you both beautifully put your arguments. Um, so I now request the speaker against the motion to put forth his her views. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, Ms. Yes, Nicola. you are. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nikhila, and I'll be speaking against the topic. The will to survive and the preservation of self is one of the basic instincts a human could have. And yet the choice to die is willingly made by people on a daily basis. This could be attributed to various reasons, such as depression, anxiety, feelings of hopelessness, or guilt. And the same is the case with people who choose to be euthanized. According to an article... Not very audible, Nicola. Could you please... Um, can I repeat that? Yeah. Yes, yes. Could I? Like, does yeah, the now it's fine. Again? Now it's good. Okay. Can, I, can you start the timer again? I'm really confused now. Okay. Um, wait. Okay. The, the will to live and the preservation of self is one of the basic instincts a human could have. And yet the choice to die is willingly made by people on a daily basis. This could be attributed to various reasons, such as depression, anxiety, feelings of hopelessness, and guilt. And the same is the case with people who choose to be euthanized. According to an article published in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry, in countries where physician-assisted suicide is legal, there have been records of doctors admitting to skipping psychiatric evaluation of the patients they have euthanized. And very few of these healthcare personnel admit, like, you know, admitted that they were confident enough to assess the mental abilities of these patients. Physician compliance with people who seek euthanasia due to their own guilt or counter-transference can increase the number of deaths. People can be coerced into dying either directly or indirectly by others who might seek to gain from their death, financially lose from keeping them alive or other social reasons, which is practically impossible for a physician to determine. Another vulnerable group that is affected by the legalization of euthanasia is AIDS patients. In a study conducted amongst HIV zero positive patients, it was found that 50% of them requested for PAS in the name of psychological suffering alone, and 26% simply demanded it. So done with that. Euthanasia is definitely going to normalize a lot of untimely and preventable deaths, which could keep a doctor from trying his very best to find a cure. After all, it's only a matter of time before the patient gives up and chooses death himself, making the doctor no longer a liability. Death will no longer be considered a loss, as people may claim that alleviation of one's suffering is a victory. 
and mal practitioners will obviously be more inclined to suggest pas to the poor or sick moving on there's plenty of examples which present with loopholes showing that this is not such a great idea and the legalities and ethics of euthanasia cannot be clearly separated both the netherlands and oregon make no specific mention about the degree of pain and the like you know who they consider to be terminal in canada only 30% of the population has access to proper palliative and hospice treatment making the rest of the population quite vulnerable to making bad decisions switzerland has extremely lax laws and sees people visit all year round in the name of suicide tourism and euthanasia will create a vortex that will make all these vulnerable groups gravitate towards what will feel like the only solution is like it is death making it a killing machine acute precipitation of physical or emotional pain can make any of us make hasty decisions especially in loosely specified legal settings and moreover there's a risk of euthanasia extending to non terminal healthy and non voluntary people i would like to add that a study conducted by new england journal of medicine in flanders belgium showed that 27% of the euthanized deaths in 2015 were without consent i would like to end my argument by saying that 108 countries have scrapped the death penalty to prevent the accidental killing of one innocent among a group of criminals so shouldn't euthanasia be held to the same standard in the same society thank you that was great you put forth your views so confidently now i would like to request the rebuttal hi i am audible yes yes uh, all right uh, my question to the fe- fellow opponent is that uh, how can one compare the death penalty of a criminal who has done something wrong to euthanasia which is for alleviating the pain of a sufferer who has been suffering from a long time and will continue to suffer for at least a few months if if euthanasia has not been conducted today okay can i answer that like can i start yeah yes okay so this death penalty has been scrapped in all these countries because they don't want to accidentally kill an innocent among that group of criminals so going by your argument i would say that if an innocent were convicted of a crime he didn't commit he would also be suffering it's a different kind of suffering but it's suffering nevertheless so to avoid the state they have scrapped the death penalty and if you compare the two groups here one group is a group of criminals with one likely one or two likely innocent people compared to a group of bedridden people most of them are innocent i mean what is the likelihood of them being criminals so in the same society euthanasia is definitely bound to cause a few non voluntary deaths they may be by accident but how are you going so far ahead to prevent the deaths of like you get it some of them are criminals but here it's the same standard applied to patients so that that was my argument if i was clear thank you so much team one you were really amazing great enthusiasm seems like um and this is just the beginning so thank you so much team one proceeding further i would call upon team two that is go karuna karuna go to begin Uh, hi, uh, I'm Alish, and I'll be speaking for the topic of euthanasia. Can I start? Yeah. Euthanasia comes from two words, two Greek words: eu, meaning good, and euthanasia, uh, tantos, meaning death. So euthanasia basically stands for good death. Now, the, uh, as the word suggests, good death, euthanasia is done for the alleviation of suffering of the people who are terminally ill. According to anonymous surveys in Washington from 1995, 26% of the responding physicians had received at least one request for PAS. And a similar survey conducted in San Francisco for AIDS patient that 98% of the respondents of the physicians had received requests for PAS. Now, these are very old surveys, but a recent survey in 2017 found that 60 67% of the doctors, uh, 67% of the people believe that doctors should be allowed to. Uh, allowed to do euthanasia or assist patients with suicide that is physician assisted suicide or pas now what are the causes of uh, euthanasia or what are the factors that push a person to euthanasia the first one is pain uh, physical conditions that affect the quality of life that is people uh, unable to uh, breathe swallow who have paralysis who have unbearable pain and nausea apart from the physical factors there are also psychological factors like depression or feeling of burden loss of sense of worth since we as a society attach 
uh, sense of worth to a person working and being independent when people lose this basic qualities they feel that they are a burden on pe- on their families and their friends the third point is about autonomy if a person has the autonomy to live the way he or she wants then they should have the autonomy to die the way he or she wants uh, in exercising autonomy or self determination individuals take responsibility for their lives and since dying is a part of life they should be allowed to decide how this is done when we harness together uh, the individuals of uh, the value of autonomy and self determination or people promoting their own well being then i think the moral foundation for euthanasia is clear the third one uh, in our society euthanasia is illegal however de- do not resuscitate dnr or passive euthanasia as it is sometimes called is still legal so what is the difference between euthanasia and dnr the basic difference is in behavior which is described in acts or omission and this is often a matter of pragmatics rather than anything deeper of moral importance because a doctor who attends a dnr and a doctor who conducts euthanasia will have the same moral implications that is he or she let the patient die when something could have been done and if we believe that a per- patient can give dnr is competent then why can't we establish such competency guidelines for the patients giving euth- uh, for giving uh, consent for euthanasia thank you thank you so much to share your views um, now i request the rebuttal Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. So the speaker mentioned something about all of these people losing their sense of worthlessness, and uh, he cited that as a reason to support his stand stance pro euthanasia. Right. So um, there's plenty of psychiatric help available. and a sense of worthlessness is not really considered terminal because a lot can be done there's hospice care there's therapy there's literal drugs in the form of antidepressants anything can be done so why would you say that this is your stance to like you know just end a person's life because a lot of like a lot of people go through mental illnesses and in that moment they would want to end their life but is it a good enough reason for you to be advocating for such a big law and a change in the society yeah i'm done can i answer yeah uh so three points basically the first one that researchers in netherlands have found that pain is not a significant reason for requesting euthanasia but rather it is frustration over loss of independence or the sense of worth as i had put it so one it is a widely prevalent problem second uh the my opponent said that Uh, counsel is available anti depressants are available so on and so forth but the question here really is how many people can actually access these yeah i agree they are available they are out there it's nice to hear someone say that yes there are counselors and there are medicines but the question is how many people can actually access these facilities and and even if they can access there is a so, uh, these people be treated as social outcasts because our society looks down upon people who seek help for mental health yes it's wrong but that's where we are at this point of time and the third point being that uh, hospice care is available and so on and so forth to make their lives better it is there i'm not saying it's not there but one again it's very costly not accessible to all and second even hospice care has a lot of side effects people ha- have incontinence they they are in a semi uh, semi uh, insomnolent stage where they are awake half the time and they do not they're not aware what's happening the other half it's because of the high dose of medications that are given to these patients and so if a patient feels that he or she does not need to go through this to you know to basically i'm sorry to say this but die at the end of the stage then i think it is the right of the patient to choose when and how to end his life thank you okay thank you so much um got your point, points quite well now i would call the speaker to speak against the motion hi am i audible Yes, you are. Just a second. Let me set my laptop. Okay. Is uh is it clear still? Yes. Okay. Great. So, greeting judges. The opposition's argument is primarily based on two points. Number one, legalizing active euthanasia will allow a good death of a person. and secondly that the person has the right to autonomy that is to say he he can decide when and where he should die i'll first tackle the autonomy 
for a decision to be autonomous three conditions need to be followed number one the person should be of sound mind but mental illnesses is common in the terminally ill as well as those requesting active euthanasia a study published in 2008 in the bmj showed that one in six person opting for active euthanasia actually was suffering from undiagnosed clinical depression secondly drugs like steroids and dopamine antagonists like metoclopramide in the terminally ill patient actually leads to them not being able to think clearly the second requirement for an autonomous decision is that that should be free from any coercion but as per the oregon public health the statistics of 2014 where youth active euthanasia is legalized being a burden to the family was the third most common reason for active euthanasia while incurable pain was the sixth most reason right so subtly and subconsciously the patient is is falling into the trap of coercion right lastly for an autonomous decision you need adequate disclosure of the prognosis of the disease therefore uh, but on the contrary the royal college of general practitioners in their statement before the select committee on assisted dying in the uk said that i quote when prognosis is provided in months the scope of error extends into year thus the thus the information on which base on which basis the autonomous decision is made is like is not quite accurate lastly legalizing youth active euthanasia actually leads to the person giving up of autonomy why because now the whether or not the person is euthanized actually depends on a doctor a team of doctor or the court for that matter right so but even if we consider that all of the safeguards uh and all of like if, even if we consider that patient is the best actor in this debate there are three reasons why there are exclusive harm of euthanasia number one euthanasia will erode public trust in two ways firstly it will send a message that the state now wants to get rid of people who in the future by the definition of euthanasia will become a potential in, uh, potential financial and physical burden secondly doctors apart from being called a money making machine will also become a killing machine thus eroding public trust La so uh, the second harm the political and scientific scientific will to find a cure for so called incurable current disease will reduce the als ice bucket challenge which could gather so much funds for uh, uh, finding the gene which caused als now will not happen at a point at which active euthanasia is legalized and endorsed as a therapy there will be a huge loss to prospects of improving the quality of life of the terminally ill by investing to discover new drugs thirdly vulnerable groups like female especially in india who are often at the mercy of their husband to receive health care will now be at a higher risk to seek, to seek premature termination of their life to avoid suffering later in their terminal state therefore they'll want to actively shorten their life span thus uh, uh, euthanasia should squarely be banned thank you okay great work thank you so much um again i, I would call upon the rebuttal Am I proposes audible? argument hello yes yes you are audible um so um my question to the speaker was that he stated that doctors will become killing machines if they allow for euthanasia when the patient is asking for it with informed consent so i want i wanted to ask you even in cases like abortion which is legal in india by the way because when the mo- when the mother asks for abortion whether it is for congenital malformations or any other reasons even then doctors like it is currently being performed and doctors aren't being called killing machines because it is the right of the mother a and b it is up to the mother and we don't know what she has gone through so keeping that in mind how would you justify the doctors are called killing machines for something for which the patient is asking for as in the patient okay. is asking for euthanasia with informed consent in in such cases how would you okay. justify so two main points from your side first of all you are saying why is it wrong when the patient is asking for something we should provide it right uh, and second you are saying uh, why not abortion um, and like the relation between abortion and euthanasia uh, many responses to that number one that consent technically means that whenever you are offering a spectrum of treatment the patient has the right to choose consent does not mean you can choose right if you have like uh, for example if you have cancer and surgery is indicated you can say i want surgery but you cannot go and ahead and tell that okay i need like terminal sedation drugs right that's the first difference secondly i have i've told you that in, this is not informed consent squarely for the reason i have like spent two minutes of my speech but i'm going to give you one more evidence if you request it a study conducted in india was found that three of the 191 advanced cancer patients had a strong desire for death and all of them had severe depression thus it's not informed consent for the like the three reasons i've you like clearly told you now coming to the abortion argument 
first of all uh, a mother asking for abortion is different because first the mother's life is at danger as well right uh, but even if you consider that the mother's life is not at danger and still she is asking for abortion understand what the euthanasia means euthanasia is actively shortening the life of a person it's different from passive euthanasia where death is already ensued and you are removing or the patient is refusing a withholding or a withdrawal of treatment right at a point at which death has already started in in we consider abortion right it's like the female is at a risk therefore we are conducting it as a therapeutic uh, to save the life of the mother because like uh, the, the basic philosophy tells that like the living person that is the mother in this case is more important to save than the fetus in that case right so it's not it's not a, a completely a, like a, a, like an equation which can draw between abortion uh, and um, euthanasia for that matter and and lastly uh, euthanasia has good alternatives like palliative care which can actually alleviate the symptoms of pain and give a good death which all of the benefits you are seeing while on the other hand uh, the, the 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 alternative to abortion is raising up a congenitally malformed child or a a mother who has been left by her husband right that that the alternative is that bad on that side while we have good uh, palliative care even if the access currently is less it will be better in a few years because of the political will to cut, like conduct research thank you so much team 2 um we're all going great isn't it continuing good evening Adobe. everyone uh respected judges and participants i just like to mention here that uh, all our respected judges are free to ask for any clarifications or questions to our participants thank you respected judges would you like to ask anything from our participants only only one uh, point please i am dr alka that uh, some of the people who are speaking on rebuttal are not putting on their videos and i think they must up front and say i am so and so because on the screen sometimes we cannot make out who is speaking thank you okay thank you so much ma'am next up we have our team 3 golden oldies uh, get ready team 3 and also at the same time i request the rebuttal team met synergy um hi before i begin can you confirm that i'm audible yes you are sure let me know when i can start yeah you may start death is the opposite of life but the act of dying is a crucial part of living a very good evening to everyone here i am ananya menon and i am here to convince you that euthanasia is not only ethical but essential at the outset let me point out that this is by no means a novel concept euthanasia has existed in some form or the other in almost every culture the ancient greeks used hemlock to hasten death closer to home exists the hindu practice of priyopavishana by which a terminally ill person with no responsibilities or desire in life would fast to death medical science has come a long way since then but immortality still lies beyond our grasp at the end of the day death is still inevitable we all know that so if given the choice wouldn't it be so much better to be able to pass painlessly with dignity with all of our affairs in order and surrounded by our loved ones given this I propose that euthanasia be seen as a standard component of palliative health care. Coming to the logistics of the situation, my opponents may argue that families would begin to pressure vulnerable members into accepting euthanasia, perhaps against their wishes and before their time. But once legalized, the red tape and regulations surrounding this would be more than stringent enough to prevent this from occurring. Soundness of mind is easy enough to establish, and more importantly, as this practice becomes more widespread. so would the concept of living wills a person could specify years or even decades in advance the explicit conditions under which they would like to be put out of their pain from a more mercenary point of view euthanasia would certainly free up medical resources currently being utilized by patients with no hope of recovery no quality of life and no will to live the right to life should i believe be superseded by the right to choose 
if i consider my life to have been lived to its fullest if i do not wish to carry on existing the way that i am if my family and i are both ready to let go then why am i being denied this right i firmly believe that in the years to come those opposing euthanasia would come to be seen as almost barbaric through inaction to prolong a person's suffering against their explicit wishes if removed from a medical setting this could almost be the premise of a horror movie is what we fear really death itself or is it the slow decline that inevitably precedes it the pain the gradual loss of self the sword of democles hanging over our heads never knowing when it may fall that is what truly terrifies us and that is what we today have the power to ease to conclude i'd like to leave you with this funerals and remembrances those are for the living but the way we choose to die i firmly believe should be in our own hands thank you thank you so much ananya you expressed it so well now i would request the speaker against of meds energy for the rebuttal Meds energy. Team Meds energy, are you there? No, what about? Yes, you are. Um. Hi. Uh. So my question is, how do you negate the possibility that a slippery slope effect will ensue? That is, once voluntary euthanasia is legalized, it will also lead to involuntary euthanasia being legalized. okay um thank you for your question i fear that the slippery slope argument is one that is overused to prevent any sort of progress from happening in society the same argument was used against the legalization of abortion 50 years ago in india when we say that abortion is legalized it's always been voluntary at the patient's request it's never been us deciding that you don't deserve to have a baby or just going out and killing random fetuses just because we now have the power to do so i feel the slippery slope argument is not really one that is applicable here because euthanasia desire uh, de- uh, reverts from the express wishes of both the patient and maybe their family if the patient is unable to consent as well as in an ideal situation psychologists as well as their medical care providers thank you thank you thank you so much ananya now um i would call upon the speaker against speaking against the motion from team meds energy from team golden oldies from team golden oldies okay can you hear me yes we can hello shreya can you hear me yes yes uh hello, hello. yes sir you are yeah, yeah, yes. so sorry apologies for that please tell me when to start yeah you can start the timer yeah uh we don't need the timer for the rebuttals uh, you can just uh, continue oh ma'am i am the speaker From okay the... you are the speaker okay yes, okay so i I'd, i'd like a timer if you don't mind yes you yes few ideas in medicine and society have inspired as much moral and ethical dilemmas as euthanasia has good evening ladies and gentlemen i am adwai andhekar from the golden oldies and i am immensely privileged to represent the opposition bench and help clear the proposition's emotionally charged rhetoric and focus on the facts let's start objectively by comparing euthanasia with a principally similar but not as emotionally charged policy do not resuscitate orders even in an ideal scenario with consenting patients competent doctors and watertight guidelines a us study showed that dnr orders were twice as likely to be pay- placed by physicians on african americans non english speakers chronic alcoholics and hiv patients showing that no matter how perfect on paper guidelines are the doctors implementing them are human and hence they have stereotypes about who's worth saving and who's not the proposition's core point then is about euthanasia being in the patient's best interest but the problem with that is just like dnr orders euthanasia isn't just a differential diagnosis we are testing it's irreversible 
imagine a scenario where a terminally ill patient is depressed but her demand for euthanasia is actually a cry for help in fact let me quote a geriatric specialist from the canadian senate committee on euthanasia and assisted suicide and i quote i have seen aids patients being completely abandoned by their parents sisters lovers and in a total state of isolation cut off from every sense of life and affection seeing death as the only liberation when in reality all they want in life is close and powerful love and support unquote yes the crushing weight of feeling unwanted the pressure of being a burden financially or otherwise these are deep seated complex issues that instead of meaningfully and ethically addressing euthanasia just sweeps under the carpet and gives a final solution to speaking of final solutions it's worth noting like someone brought up that the nazis initially sugar coated or in this case cyanide coated their genocide as voluntary euthanasia for the benefit of the patient obviously we aren't all nazis but in today's privatized corporation dictated mba governed medical industry doctors opinions are strongly influenced by costs that's the truth and with respect to euthanasia that's a problem a 1998 study found that cost conscious doctors are significantly more likely to prescribe lethal injections for terminally ill patients speaking about costs ladies and gentlemen the underlying theme of today's debate revolves around the cost of a human life for a healthy versus a disabled versus a patient on his deathbed but surprisingly especially because we are doctors we haven't explored another theme the sanctity of human life you see as able bodied people we look at things from our perspective seeing life as with disability as a disaster filled with suffering and frustration legalizing or as this motion says even ethically green lighting euthanasia legitimizes this bias sending the message that it's better to be dead than to be sick or disabled that some lives aren't worth living and this ladies and gentlemen is morally and ethically outrageous to the opposition bench and hence i'm proud to oppose thank you thank you adbay for those riveting words i would now like to invite arushi sharma from the team med synergy for the rebuttal uh am i audible may i start yeah yeah okay. you're audible uh so yeah my able opponent quoted that most of euthanasia is due to depression right so may i ask uh is it necessary that every person who opts for a living will or who signs a dnr form is liable for depression is he is he not competent enough in due time when the terminal stage of his disease has not yet started to form a competent opinion about his own death also you said that uh, the hospitals today are very cost governed right and they are being run by corporate houses so i believe that if a person uh, is on life support system which is one of the most costly equipment a hospital can charge for so i believe that such hospitals would prefer to keep patients on life support they are earning lakhs and lakhs of rupees every day uh, from these life supports so when you said that uh, cost conscious doctors uh, working in co co in these corporate hospitals would make decisions of withdrawing patients from life support doctors are just workers there Uh, how do you justify that doctors make such decisions such de such decisions i believe are made by the hospital administration please clarify okay sure uh, thank you for the question arushi uh, i'll i'll address both of these points the depression aspect and the corporate aspect i'll address the second one first arushi i don't think uh, you got my point when i explained that when i okay so i'll give you a fact medicaid the one of the biggest care providers in the us health insurance for poor people medicaid spent 30% of their 2014 or 15 budget on a select 3% of the population above the age of 65 years of age and all of those 3% passed away within that year that is what i meant by the financial argument so if there are some people like you said you know these mba people sitting you know on the board of medicare or medicaid do you think if euthanasia is legalized ethically green lighted and more importantly normalized once that happens how difficult is it going to be for them to you know slightly change the scenarios modify the rules you know you, you know like uh, cholesterol com drug making companies keep lowering the blood pressure levels of cholesterol so more people keep taking medicines these companies can just gradually keep reducing the levels and uh, enable people for cost saving benefits to you know obviously kill people faster that's that's the basic answer so i think i was very uh, clear when i expressed the corporatization of euthanasia that's going to happen now your second points with respect to depression there's so 
the point that i was trying to bring out when i brought the example of de depression was that euthanasia is irreversible it is not a differential diagnosis we are testing obviously let's assume that you know we are living in a world of competent doctors but everyone makes mistakes what if a patient is diagnosed in a in a wrong way and that person person is not terminally ill what if the prognosis that a doctor has given a patient is not right what if that patient using that example was depressed in all of these scenarios once even with the checks and balances of a you know an ideal uh, euthanasia policy agreement even in the system the mistakes that is that are that doctors make that are inherent in medicine ours is a profession of mistakes i mean we have to take bets in that in case of euthanasia a wrong answer is not just a wrong differential diagnosis a wrong answer is permanent irreversible death so that's what i wanted to bring about yeah uh, respected judges yeah uh, adwe i think there were, there were just too many ifs there uh, respected judges or uh, organizers yeah, yeah, yeah. uh uh one thing please uh uh adve uh, he he just uh, in my in the first question i asked uh, regarding depression he uh, i i'm sorry i i am not completely satisfied because he talked about euthanasia being an uh, a, a different or a wrong decision but i was asking about living wills a person with full competency a, f- a person can uh, you know uh, provide a living will when he's 18 years old or he's 20 years old and he may get the disease when he's 80 or 70 so do i have time to respond that person is competent enough yeah yeah okay so once again i'll just hey uh, hey i'm so sorry to interrupt here but uh, due to paucity of time i don't think we can allow cross questioning today so sure. okay sure. okay uh, next up we have the team med synergy the speaker for arushi please take over the podium is yours okay oh uh, may i start or uh oh uh, shreya uh, may i start hello arushi yeah you may begin yeah okay yeah you Being in the medical profession, we come across patients in a permanent vegetative state, or those who are totally dependent on others, enduring great pain and suffering. While there is absolutely nothing medicine can do to make them better or relieve their agony, is it not more humane to allow a person with intractable suffering to live in peace, rather than making him deliberately bear this pain in the name of care? good palliative and hospice facilities make important contributions to the care of the dying but neither is a panacea patients have to endure side effects of opioid drugs and most treatment is based on trial and error till the right combination is found for the patient the rosy pictures painted about wonder drugs often turn out to be chimeras euthanasia is already being practiced all across the globe in hidden forms Closes friends and family decide when to pull the plug on the ventilator out of loss of hope or financial gain. All this is done without the informed consent of the patient. Is this not involuntary euthanasia? Doctors prescribe heavy dosage of opioid drugs during palliative sedation, which shortens the life of the patient. Are we not indulging in assisted suicide then? Patients have a right to refuse treatment. withholding death for some time many believe that the legalization of euthanasia will increase acceptability towards involuntary euthanasia with hidden malicious motives living wills have been provided in india in order to prevent such incidences in the netherlands over 60% of the total cases were those of voluntary euthanasia while a vast majority of other cases were no longer competent and the decision was taken in consultation with doctors and closest family which is equivalent to cutting the ventilator from a comatose patient is euthanasia an ethical request to end pain and suffering or just a poor poor admit to committing suicide the choice to end one's life by euthanasia is a culmination of processes including disclosure of medical information prognosis 
alternative treatments designed to ensure that the individual is fully aware of the gravity of the step he is proposing. The Hippocratic Oath talks of going into the houses of the patients for the benefit of the ill. Won't it benefit the ill to have a dignified death rather than enduring an artificially extended life on ventilators and respirators filled with dependence and pain? This is a call of conscience that we need to dwell deeper upon as future doctors. Thank you. Thank you, Arushi. Uh, I now invite uh, the speaker against Adwe to for the rebuttal. Thanks. Can start time. Yeah. So, uh, Arushi, once can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello, Adwe. You're perfectly audible. Please continue. Oh, thank you. I, there's some issues here. Yeah. So, uh, Arushi, uh, great speech. Wonderful rhetoric painting of the same old terminally ill bedridden patients. The proposition keeps coming out with this, but there's some things that I want to ask you. Arushi, I'll, this is just one question I'll ask. You're okay. a doctor, Arushi. You have a patient who has HIV, okay? And uh, that patient turns out to be homosexual, which is a which is a stigmatized problem in India. Now, this patient doesn't have family, doesn't have friends, does, has no one coming to visit him or her. And this patient, suppose euthanasia is legalized in India, will come out and tell you that, you know what, I life is not worth living. And I, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I don't have, I, I don't have any, there's no reason for me to live, continue living. Now, as a doctor, you can see for a fact that this is not just this is a result of depression and depression is a temporary problem. Depression is an example I'm using, but any other temporary such problem, any other circumstance in the patient's life, if they've gone through some major life incident and they feel that as of now, I don't feel like living. Will you, what would you do in your scenario and how would you justify it ethically saying that, you know, for a fact that this patient, if his socioeconomic circumstances change, if his uh, circum family circumstances change, if many other aspects change, if the patient, like a speaker brought about before, gets access to good hospice care, good palliative care with a good supportive environment, you know for a fact that this patient within one year is probably going to be back on her feet, you know, out and living. In all good conscience, can you, and if so, how do you justify putting that patient down? Uh, okay, so may I uh, start? Yes, yes, Arushi. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, so first of all, uh, we euthanasia, we are talking about voluntary euthanasia, right? So a cooling off period is normally required before uh, such pleas for euthanasia are accepted. And we are not advocating death for a person who yesterday said that he wants to survive, he wants to fight, and tomorrow he can say that uh, in a moment of weakness that no, I want death for myself. So that's not possible. The process and the the process of uh, the plea of for euthanasia to be accepted is a very tedious one. It is regulated by many many factors, including its review by the at the hands of many many medical boards, and they include all the th all the factors which come into play at the level of the patient, the socioeconomic factors that you were talking about the stigmatization of the hands of society that you were talking about since the person is a homosexual, I presume. So yes, uh, euthanasia is a very, is a, is a topic, is such a topic which cannot be resolved in terms of, what can we say? Uh, in terms of, in plain objective terms, let's just put it like that. It cannot be uh, resolved in plain objective terms. There are many, many factors which come into play and they are all reviewed by the medical boards. And in India, you need the approval of the Supreme Court to where even voluntary euthanasia has not been legalized. But I believe that if it is to be legalized, it will need the permission of the Supreme Court because Supreme Court is now presiding over cases of passive euthanasia. So if passive, if passive euthanasia is being presided on by the Supreme Court, what makes you believe that cases of voluntary euthanasia would not be done by would not be presided upon by the supreme court and i believe that in all their uh, competency the judges the supreme court judges will consider all these factors we are talking about euthanasia for those who 
have a permanent vegetative existence existence those who are totally dependent on upon others those who have completely lost their sense of dignity the that person with hiv he can walk he can talk it's only his socio economic factors and the stigmatization that is preventing him from doing all these things which are uh, you know comparing him into the deep abyss of depression so for for that reason we cannot euthanize a patient that's what i'm talking uh, about i i believe that you are satisfied but again the there must be stringent laws governing euthanasia that's what uh, my conclusion would be there so must, arushi, there must uh, be... so arushi just let me button so you are you are saying you are not going to give euthanasia to this person no i'm really not i'm not so, saying that i'm going to give euthanasia no 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 i'm just saying because you're for for euthanasia so would you want to give because it's a very straight question do you want to give euthanasia to this no i would not want to give euthanasia for that uh, okay so do you do you feel is, do you feel do you feel a mental do you feel a mental condition is less less problematic to a person than actually a person who is bedridden and having chronic conditions do you mean that way are we saying that mental health actually, is not uh, giving that's that part importance is that what you're trying to say uh actually i believe see, you that... can you can you can give me a yes and no uh, you don't need to explain uh, could you please repeat i said do you feel mental health is not as important as a chronic bedridden physical condition psychiatric euthanasia is not being legalized in many nations no no no, no no that's really... not the answer so yeah okay. definitely mental uh, yeah uh, mental diseases and illnesses can be cured but a, a persistent vegetative state no it cannot be cured even a pers persons exist in vegetative state for years at an end so okay uh, just to i mean i don't want to take more time i would just say ultimately a chronic bedridden patient would be physically and mentally affected both so we are looking at a complex paradigm there but that does not mean mental health is lesser or Uh, I mean, greater. So, I mean, just to clear off, because the 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 bedridden patient is also mentally affected to a great extent. So, let me be clear: it's not that it's only the physical ailment that is affecting them. Uh, I think I think that's an enough comment on this. So, I think we can go on to the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Arushi. Um, here, I would like to request respectable judges. If there are any queries or questions from our participants, yeah, just judges. one, yeah, one more question, uh, Arushi. What made you think that uh, the Supreme Court decides everything? Because they have already passed the judgment, and that is regarding um, passive euthanasia. Sir, uh, uh, in in the Supreme Court judgment that was given in two thousand eighteen, it was clearly stated that the Supreme Court would preside over the cases of passive no. euthanasia once they, they are said, passed. They said the they talked about a medical board. It's not that yes, every so case. Yes, they talked about the medical board regarding uh, when when the patient is in a permanent vegetative state in the hospital, or if the person in the hospital becomes incurable, then the hospital has to constitute a medical board. And in case of a living will, uh, when the patient has given a living will and he reaches a terminal state, then uh, the living will has to be you know presided over by a medical board at the time of its conception and. then at the time when the patient is in a terminal state but again supreme court uh, uh, i i can send you the link uh, it, it in a report by the indian express a very reputed newspaper in a report by the times of india all these said that the supreme court would like to preside and would be presiding over such cases if the need arises uh, in passive euthanasia and if we have such stringent laws in place for passive euthanasia then obviously uh, when we uh talk about voluntary euthanasia we uh we must be having if and when it is legalized we must be having uh, very tough laws to govern that so that no discrepancy arises in the future thank you it that has been a very riveting conversation uh, let's move on to the next speaker and move our debate forth uh, i invite now kavya singhal from medsynergy The dice is yours. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Kafia, you are. Whatever crazy sorrow said, no life that breathes with human breath 
has ever truly longed for death. Greetings to the house. I'll be speaking against the motion of the topic, Euthanasia is Ethical, Why Prolonged Painful Existence? Firstly, euthanasia is by no means ethical. Legalizing euthanasia neglects the sanctity of life and discourages patients rather than showing them that their lives are to be treasured even in their worst state. We cannot approve of death as a procedure to escape hardships of life. But I won't waste time of the scientific community here by venturing into religious jargon. And I'll just uh, tell you how this concept is flawed at three core principles. First cause, second procedure, third consequence. My opponents here reiterate that pain is the major cause for which people sought, uh, seek euthanasia. Well, their beliefs are unfounded because only about one third cases of euthanasia are due to pain, whereas two thirds are due to a feeling of loss of dignity and comfort. So in the state of Oregon in USA, pain couldn't make it to the top five reasons for which people sought euthanasia. So rather than a painful existence, it is physical dependence and a feeling of being a burden on others that people wish to escape, which is disappointing. Coming to the second part, the major fault with the procedure is that patients in a permanent vegetative state cannot make conscious decisions. Forget that. How can I expect any terminally ill person to make prudent decisions keeping clinical depression and moments of weakness in place? Uh, my able opponent here advocates the right to life and right to die, but we need to protect our people against such whims just like the basic structure doctrine of our constitution does. In fact, euthanasia is against egalitarianism because certain people will have the authority to decide who is eligible to die and who is not, and that is not you claiming independence or sovereignty. Once we allow doctors to kill patients, we'll be, not be able to limit killings to those who want to die. Euthanasia would become an even better smoke screen than suicide to cover up murders. We must ask ourselves these questions. Are we going to finish Hitler's job? Coming to the outcomes part. In Belgium and Netherlands, they have already opened it up for mental illnesses and even children. You see, this is where we are heading with. I opine that death is an easy solution. Our focus should be to develop better palliative care and pain relieving medicines. And since there is potential for abuse and mistakes, I propose that each case of human ailment should be judged upon its own merit, rather than laying down a specific dogma for all situations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kapya. Um, I'd request the speaker for the rebuttal round. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Ananya Menon and uh, I loved your speech. Uh, so, so since this whole debate is about the ethics and not the logistics of euthanasia, I'll keep my question brief and the ethics. Suppose a few years from now you are a doctor and you have a patient in front of you, an 80-year-old with end-stage cancer. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this patient has no hope for improvement. For the last few years, this patient and their family have been begging you to put them out of their misery. You are assured that you will not be seen as a killer, but you will be seen as an angel of mercy. How can you justify not doing it? Primum non nocere. Firstly, do no harm. Through your inaction, you are allowing this person's unbated suffering to continue day by day. How can you possibly justify to yourself that it is more ethical to watch them suffer than it is to put them out of their misery? Uh, thank you for your question, Ananya. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that uh, there is an option of palliative sedation too, which can control symptoms peacefully and ethically without uh, you know, shortening or ending a person's... Sorry. I think not. So there's uh, option of palliative sedation, which can control symptoms peacefully and ethically without shortening or ending a person's life. So, uh, you know, euthanasia is not the only option to relieve pain. You have to take that into consideration. Secondly, um, opposition, of, opposition of euthanasia not necessarily supports dysthanasia, where a dying person's life is extended through technological means without regard to person's quality of life. And you cannot uh, just uh, look at this particular incident because you are supporting euthanasia. You think euthanasia should be legalized. So uh, just, by, just by giving me this particular case, you cannot force me to make a decision that euthanasia should be legalized and should be followed in each case. You know, th uh, there, would be, there would be the slippery slope effect and there, uh, there would be the uh, possibility of 
uh, when people venturing into involuntary euthanasia, there would be possibility of misuse of this policy. You know, even uh, in India and in other Asian countries, there would be murders, there would be political assassinations. So, you know, uh, you are bringing in this emotional concept here, you're bringing in an emotional case here, but we have to think logically about this. So, uh, uh, yeah, that would be my question to you, uh, my answer to your question. Um, okay, thank you so much, Kafia. Um, here, I would like to um, invite the next team, Opinionatives, um, Janmejay Singh. Pragmatics, the rebuttal team, please get ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, shall I start now? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jan Major Singh. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jan Major Singh, and I'm to go and I'm going to uh, speaking in favor of euthanasia. First of all, before starting anything, I would like I would uh, like to express that I do understand the concerns of all of my fellow medical students who are opposing the idea, and I just wish them to understand that sometimes things aren't just so black and white, and sometimes we have to make some choices and decisions that just for the sake of greater good. Euthanasia is such an idea. While there's no uh, sugar coating that they would that that can be done to anyways justify the loss of a life, but sometimes that's an idea we have to entertain. Many people, good people, who are suffering every day, bearing unbearable pain due to chronic illnesses like cancer, rabies, etc., and even the present medicine isn't able to help uh, to help them anyways. They are enduring such pain every day, stuck inside a hospital walls abandoned and disabled. And we just can't do anything anything further to help them anyhow. So in those cases, I know I might sound inhuman to allow them to make a choice such heinous, but it's, such, it's, it's just as inhuman to keep them in pain and let them suffer every day when there's nothing further helpful that could be done at this point. No medicines, procedure, surgical procedure, nothing could be, the help, uh, could be done to help, them, uh, to help them anymore. I believe it's just as, as human to let someone walk, uh, uh, to let someone walk into the tunnels endlessly and endlessly in pain where there's no light in the end of it. So euthanasia could be a way through which they themselves and their families could be relieved from the enormous psychological and emotional suffering only if they have already crossed that bridge. What I mean to say is euthanasia as an idea shouldn't even be entertained before the, the bridge has been crossed when there's no further hope left. So it's uh, so uh, um, no, if euthanasia, if ever to be considered, can't be some, something that can be advertised to the general public. The whole implementation of such a great thing have to be very responsibly handled and used should be uh, and you should be uh, should not even be considered if there's no other hope left. It's already legalized in many countries like UK and Netherlands. Some of them, because of their more responsible and exclusive implementation, is, has shown to uh, have a positive results for its population. Euthanasia is only to be performed after the written consent of the person, his family, the doctors handling his case, multiple specialists regarding uh, his problem, uh, a psychiatrist to ensure the decision he's making has a full awareness of the consequences and not influenced by any other mental illness. The power to carry out such practice would be granted to only central government selected medical centers and only be performed by limited qualified medical practitioners. If euthanasia ever to be brought on the table, it has to be very controlled and limited practice and, con and con to be considered in a, in a situation of sheer hopelessness. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Jan Thank Majai, you. may I please ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes. Uh, you uh, several Amari. times mentioned the word hope when there is no hope. Yes, and also gave some examples of different kinds of patients who seem to be incurable. Uh, I didn't hear you saying uh, explicitly that just because there is no hope, hope for what? For cure? Yes, ma'am. For yes, cure. But then Any... how do you judge a patient, the value of a human life just because there is no hope? And who decides that there is no hope. It could be very often doctors, uh, speaking as a person who has been treating patients for long years, 
we give up hope saying that all your systems have failed there is no hope and the patient has often said to me doctor if you have no hope how can we survive so whose hope are you talking about and what is the value of life of a patient who you think there is no hope for cure would you like to answer that yes ma'am ma'am first of all i like to begin with answering your question about the value of human life ma'am for me personally and for most of us human life is of paramount importance but ma'am the quality of life also has to be taken in consideration for instance if a person is if a person is a patient of chronic illness for a long time and the hope i'm talking about is his first of all the most important hope is the hope within himself then the hope of his family and the doctors who are handling his if there's not any much much there's nothing much to do any further to help him and that to and that uh, even the consideration of different other specialists a psychiatrist and many other people uh, uh, very um, well aware of his condition his family members and everyone has to be considered in uh, uh, con- has to be considered before declaring someone's uh, situation as hopeless so my first of all i want to say that hope is very is a very ambiguous term but what i'm trying to imply is the hope is something that if it's something that is very much related to the quality of life he is living and the contribution he is doing for his family and the society thank you ma'am thank you for the great question ma'am Um, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, I'd call Nitya Vaidya for the rebuttal. Hi. Um, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, debate something like this. Just make sure. Am I audible? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. So, um, yeah. in your speech, you spoke about how euthanasia should only be considered if all the other options have been explored and there is no other hope left. So, I wanted to ask you that in India, where most of the patients who go to the government hospitals struggle to even receive the most basic quality of care, they struggle to afford the most basic quality of care. Is it even a topic, a topic that we should be discussing? That after all the stops have been pulled out, when most people don't even receive the basics. So, do you think in India? Yeah, as Indians, we should be talking about euthanasia, where it can be used as a cop out before all the basics have been covered, because most people don't even have access to that. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I answer now? Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, I would like to say that yes, in India, we have a very sub. In, in India, there is a problem regarding the medical services, especially to the lower poverty classes. and i completely agree to you that so bringing something like that on the table would actually make uh, people take their decision very carelessly and easily but for that reference so but for that reason only i put forward this idea only with the only with the conditions would only with the asterisk that this idea would only be considered when there's approval of not only just the doctor handling his case but the doctors who are also specializing in that subject who has nothing to do with him there would be references by those doctors a psychiatrist to help him and most importantly the family himself i don't think anyone anyone any person me you or anyone would uh, ever consider such a heinous option for a family man for a family person for his own family member because he loves them and until and unless there's no hope left in their eyes they wouldn't even consider something like that so it's a very emotional and also a practical thing we have to walk on a very fine line of emotional emo, our emotional stress and our practical stress but at the time of implementation it has to be the power has to lie in the hands of the government the government approved people medical practitioners and the uh, and the patient himself that those would would be the people who will have the ultimate power to make such decision and even after that there would be whole every case would be discussed in detail every case would be discussed in detail before even implying such a thing thank you that would be my answer Okay, thank you so much. Now, um, I would call upon Abhilasha Tyagi from Team Opinion Natives to speak for against the motion. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you Hello? are. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. This is Abhilasha Tyagi, and I'll be speaking against the motion. The foundation of medicine was laid upon the basic principle that the first and foremost responsibility of a physician is to save lives. to make every effort possible in the direction of saving lives and searching cures 
and the very idea of euthanasia is completely contradictory to it. Besides this, euthanasia severely violates the sanctity and dignity of human life and making such a practice legal within the frameworks of law is sure to have deleterious consequences by giving unjustified amount of power in the hands of medical professionals and the family of the patient and providing a huge window of abusing this so-called right to die as a literal right to kill. During a 2005 study of terminal illness diagnosis in the Mayo Clinic, they found that the prediction of a terminal illnesses was not accurate in a large number of instances. People who had been told that you live for five years, 10 years, ended up living 30 years or more. So how could you justify euthanizing a patient who could have otherwise lived? Okay, leaving all that aside, don't you think that euthanasia provides a very cruel way to get rid of vulnerable populations like the elderly, the mentally and the physically disabled, the economically dependent groups who do not have anyone to take care of them and would be pushed towards euthanasia by their extended family? One can never rule out the possibility of using euthanasia to get monetary gains to usurp inheritance. And how can you, how can you think that if uh, uh, an insurance company, looking at the monetary greed that rules our world today, if an insurance company is going under laws by taking care of an expensive treatment, why do you think they won't push for euthanasia? Apart from all of this, we as a society have come a long way in advancements in medical science and including palliative care and revolutionary cures for a number of diseases. At this point, I believe that our focus should be on developing better cures and to find out ways to improve the quality of life rather than promoting a discouragement like mercy killing. And how do we know that these decisions are completely voluntary and fully informed? The tiny possibility of such cases will never be fully eliminated and it outweighs whatever advancements your euthanasia, voluntary euthanasia legalization may have. There's another thing known as the slippery slope argument, which says that giving an example of Netherlands, uh, the number of euthani euthanasia cases has been rising every year there. Earlier, it was done only for terminal illnesses, but later on, people even who have uh, loss of, uh, uh, there's loss of quality of life or there is some suffering in their life, even they are pushing for euthanasia. So the value of human life in general is coming down and killing is becoming, mercy killing is becoming a casual topic, which I do not think is ideal. In conclusion, the inability to rule out the misuse by doctors and family members, in addition to being intrinsically against the values of medicine, they are strong enough reasons to not legalize a practice like euthanasia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhilasha. Um, now I'd call Athira Pankaj from Team Pragmatics for rebuttal. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for the talk. Uh, so my question would be a brief one. I would just uh, like to ask you that uh, as it is often argued against euthanasia by suggesting palliative sedation. Now, we all know palliative sedation is like sedating the patient and making them, you know, uh, decreasing their pain and everything. But do you think uh, palliative sedation is going to be the ultimate uh, sound solution and an embraced form for a suffering patient? In other words, what I mean to say is, is the pain the only thing that can distress a debilitating patient? As Sir had already asked one of the team, that uh, isn't something called as mental agony a part of a suffering of a patient. Thank you so much. I would like, uh, I would like our, thank you so much for the question. I would like our focus to be on cognitive behavioral therapy, to be on rehabilitation, to be on ways to, the, men, the same mental agony that you talk about. I would like to relieve that mental agony, to find ways to relieve that mental agony rather than killing off the patient. And that's exactly what I've been talking about. I hope that just it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask judges if there are any queries or questions. Judges, would you like to ask, please? Yes, Abhilasa, uh, tell me uh, if I ask you uh, if um, this is to be opposed. Uh, your entire argument is based on just law. Um, if I want to counter you, I would say Lord Rama committed, um, in a way, suicide because he took Jal Samadhi. Uh, from Jainism, there is a practice called Santhara. 
if people uh, they don't want to live they simply uh, stop uh, taking food water everything so uh, the entire focus of uh, your argument is just uh, medical science and people living can you support uh, any support you can draw from any uh, uh, religious social or cultural practices for your argument okay uh, uh thank you for the question sir um sir i believe that the human life is sacred it is a gift it is not something to be taken away like that so casually uh and also to make it legal to take it away so casually the examples in uh, our myths and our epics they 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 are first of all they are extremely voluntary when it comes to euthanasia the entire problem is we do not live in an ideal world here we will not be able to find out when it is completely voluntary as well as necessary because a lot of times people's interests are so conflicted in a thing as as sensitive as mercy killing that we will not be able to find out that how many unnecessary deaths are occurring in the guise of this practice and for me i believe whenever we bring in a law for the a huge population we should always take the uh, uh, take a complete view of how much good is it doing and how much harm is it doing and when we weigh that i believe euthanasia poses a bigger danger than the advantages that it will have uh, our world is uh, so hum- the we have to respect the creation of god we have to respect the life that he has given us and we cannot terminate it just like that so casually by th- saying that uh, this uh, that so and so doctors believe that this person should not live any further i feel this is trivializing human life which is the biggest thing in our world thank you thank you um thank you so much sir now i'd like to call upon the next team pragmatics um athira pankaj who who shall speak for the motion yes thank you so much can i start yes good evening everyone i'm atira pankaj and i would be for the peace or pain life or death what if we had no choice over it and someone chooses it for us cancer severe disability parkinsons and even coma no matter how much they suffer they must endure the excruciating pain diving deep through their body and mind all that they are left with is for death to dawn upon them for which they have to just keep waiting and waiting and mind you it's physical and mental agony the only way that might save them from this infliction of pain is euthanasia it removes the uncertainties and allows them to have a death of their choice at a time they are most comfortable this would allow them to live the few days hours or even minutes they have with them to the fullest and the best way possible in the three protection against self harm and respect to their fundamental right to make personal choice just picture it a dying patient singing rejoicing and forgetting about their sufferings spending time with their loved ones and later dying a peaceful death on the contrary a patient dying a painful distressed breathless and a defeated death the first scenario would surely make us sadly happy that they could enjoy in these testing times of their lives euthanasia would also help in relieving the patient of guilt and shame with regards to the caregivers they would not have to feel like a burden on people they love as quoted by a cancer fighter i'm not afraid of death but i'm surely afraid of suffering in countries which have in legalized euthanasia they can penalize a person assisting in it why just because they were trying to respect and help with the last wishes of those they care this is what seems inhuman rather than euthanasia itself although it's a physician's duty to uphold beneficence and non maleficence it is imperative that it is not at the cost of forcing the debilitating patient to live when they have made the conscious decision to end it The laws in countries and states which have given a green signal to euthanasia have layers of laws to fence it against the so-called slippery slope and abuse. It makes sure that there are two two or more doctors to examine the patient, have a, have a valid reason to choose it euthanasia, and the individual is fully informed and acting voluntarily. Frowning upon euthanasia makes the person chained to their suffering and discomfort. Though the Supreme Court of India made the landmark decision on sanctioning passive euthanasia in 2011, following the case of Arna Shanbagh, it still evades being accepted. Euthanasia is still far from real for those who want it, for those who need it. 
By legalizing euthanasia, we would give them some choice of their own because it was not their choice to fall victims to these terminal illnesses. It will help in instilling in them a belief on our life, our death, our choice. Death is not an absolute evil when necessary and life is not an absolute pleasure when rendered meaningless. And we need to accept this. Finally, what matters is how people live rather than Thank you so much, Athira. Um, I'd call Janmeja Singh for rebuttal. I'd call Abhilasha Tyagi for... Um, yeah, um, hello. Okay, um, my question would be, uh, let's take a case of a mentally ill person who has severe learning disabilities and uh, even physical disabilities related to that is not even able to take a proper decision. So of course, the quality of life is very poor. In such a case, if the family of that patient, of that person reaches out to you for euthanasia, saying that the quality of life is not good, there's no use of this person to live. What, how are you going, will you actually permit the uh, euthanasia in such a case? Uh, how do you justify that? Don't you think that it is purely because of selfish reasons uh, of the kin of the patient and that patient is, is not even in the condition to take a proper decision. So how are you going to rule this out? Thank you so much for the question. Yeah, um, see, there is a thin line of difference to decide whether a patient can be, you know, uh, taken for euthanasia or not. And that's where the law and the decision of the doctor comes in. A sound decision has to be made in this regard. And actually, we can't just superficially tell that whether the family is making a sound decision, whether they're contemplating the situation well, uh, based on the mental health of the child. We never know. So it needs thorough investigation, a proper um, scrutinizing of the situation to make sure that the child would be needing uh, or the person would be needing euthanasia or not. We can just... Um, you can't just, uh, you know, superficially tell that, okay, they might not be needing it. It would be just silly and um, selfish, selfishness on the part of the family to come out for euthanasia on the behalf of the person. That would be my view. So that's where the whole, uh, you know, the gravity of the situation lies, scrutinizing the whole situation. And if we have proper legislation and rules to make sure that there is a smooth flow of this process, I think it would be a landmark decision again with respect to euthanasia. May I just uh, comment upon what you've said, Athira, that you yourself Shama. have... Uh, sorry, your name is Shama, Athira? please. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So you yourself have admitted that there is a lot of uh, problem in actually finding out the real issue which Abhilasha has brought out and uh, so would you think that there was be a better way to come to this conclusion? You said we can't just decide in a minute. So what was your comment on advanced directives uh, and uh, thereby allowing either passive, uh, passive euthanasia to take place? That means withdrawal of support, life support, which is also a form of passive euthanasia. What is your idea about advanced directors, because not many people have spoken about that so far. Um, Ma'am, could you um, uh, just reframe the question in a better way? Uh, okay, Sorry I'll, try, I'll try to do it better. <laughs> yes, Ma'am. <laughs> I'm that sorry for it. We're talking about uh, making sudden decisions, somebody else making the decision for the patient, and the whole health team having a problem to decide is euthanasia really possible or probable here? I think that's a very difficult situation to be in. So what is your comment on advanced directives? Because though this is legalized in many countries, in India, we are not, our Supreme Court is, and the Law Commission is not able to make a firm decision about advanced directives. What is your comment on that? 
Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like to um, thank you for the question, first of all. And um, yes, I think um, that's the main, you know, the fear that people are having regarding euthanasia. Otherwise, it would have been uh, long since we uh, would have had it in an active uh, process. Now, uh, I feel that um, all the laws that are uh, presently, uh, you know, functioning in our country, uh, it would be having some of the other kind of abuse or not following properly. So that's where our action comes into process. So it's uh, once we feel that it is legalized, I think once it gets legalized, we would get to know that how people are misutilizing it and then learn how to manage the potholes as is being done for the other prevalent laws. We should surely, um, we cannot run away uh, uh, from uh, the concept of euthanasia and making a decision about it uh, just because of some people who are not respecting its sanctity and, they, and we can't keep those people hanging who badly need it. So um, according to the advanced directives, I feel it's mainly uh, with regards to the legal implications that we should have a proper stringent laws which would um, educate uh, a proper um, functioning of euthanasia process. I hope I could. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Just a small question. Uh, you mentioned uh, 2011 verdict of the Supreme Court. What is the latest uh, position yes, or legal position on euthanasia in India? Um, so I am not that well updated about the reason. This. Thank you. I can answer, isn't it, Dr. Satya, Mr. Satya? Anyone? Uh, who like to? Yeah. Anyone? Any one of you? Who is? The, what is the legal position today in India? Because I think that's important. Because you mentioned 2011 verdict. Yes, sir. and uh, many of uh, the other speakers they have talked about Supreme Court, but what is the legal position today in India? In fact, many of you mentioned about law. In fact, uh, the fact is there is no law. So I think that's where okay. our country Hello. is lacking. There is an, uh, there isn't a proper law governing euthanasia. So maybe that's where we'll have to work upon. First and foremost, uh, anybody? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, you're not visible, I suppose. I think. So I turn on my video just a second. So am I visible now? Uh, at least I cannot see you. If uh... Uh, who's speaking? So, uh, you can introduce yourself. Uh, it's Kartave. Yes, sir. Kartave. Yeah. Kartave Singh from Team Super Scrubs. Yeah. Yeah. Go so, so uh, basically, you asked the uh, current status of euthanasia in India. So, yeah. in 2018, sir, I believe the Supreme Court uh, basically they legalized that passive euthanasia could be practiced uh, by just by uh, withdrawing the life support care basis in uh, no. There's there has been there have debates the active euthanasia uh, to be legalized or not, but there is no supportive uh, arguments for that to to basically move it forward. Anybody else? Sir, yes, sir. Uh, I, I would, would like to ask. Uh, I would like to add that uh, something to that. Uh, yes. Sir, this is Arushi Sharma from uh, Teammates Energy. Uh, sir, uh, in two thousand eighteen. Um, uh, a, a bench of five judges in the Supreme Court, uh, one of them was quoted as saying, uh, after the verdict, life and death are inseparable. Every moment our bodies undergo change. Life is not disconnected from death. Uh, dying is a part of the process of living. So uh, what we can say is, this, is that the Supreme Court has included the right to die in the right to life. So they are basically stating Article 21, right to life, uh, now includes the right to death. Too. And it was covered by all the major news agencies in the world, like Al Jazeera News, uh, that we uh, uh, is kind of the routers for uh, Western uh, for Arab countries. Uh, that also, uh, in its uh, news report, uh, said that India had legalized uh, passive euthanasia. 
uh and the judges were uh, sir five ben judges uh chief inclu- which included the chief justice also deepak mishra uh, at that time uh and uh, they in a verdict uh, they legalized in a sense legalized uh, passive euthanasia in india it was the aruna shanbagh case though. uh so uh, she was not granted euthanasia as such but uh, this case was not about aruna shanbagh that was decided in 2011 uh sir again uh uh i'm so i'm so sorry i'm so sorry sir uh the court issued a verdict on a pil filed by the ngo uh, common cause in 2015 according to the website lime law and all the major uh, news agencies like uh, times of india uh reported it times of india the indian express first post the wire uh, uh every major news agency in india uh, covered Arushi, uh, this uh, piece of news i'm sorry yes, you were talking yes, about uh, the agency i asked you what is the legal position in india and what is the supreme court uh, verdict so, on that uh, can i add something please go ahead so this is abhilasha um yeah. well um well my fellow speakers have actually spoken in detail about the position right now but i just want to add one more thing that india recognizes india recognizes something known as living wills uh in which uh, a person can give explicit instructions about which uh which life support systems to switch off or what is the exact process to be followed when the when this particular person is in a vegetative state or is so ill that cannot even give consent so such living wills can be made and uh, india recognizes those that's all i want and to living know. wills uh, are there any conditions uh, they are made uh, by patients who are uh, who have been diagnosed to be terminally ill and who are expected to be in a vegetative state um th- that's and also active euthanasia is not practiced in india uh, that means you cannot explicitly administer things which will kill the patient however you can take uh, remove the so life supporting system and who takes the decision this uh okay so i said this the uh, like i ne- i need to read okay. up more on that how okay. many doctors uh, are required next sir if next. i may be allowed to speak sir uh um, you see instantly all of you are doing research and you will trying to uh, google things and then trying to uh, no sir i did explicit research on this topic much before so uh, i i I you can, kind you of can, am a little please. well versed, uh, um, uh, sir. Uh, actually, this is Arushi Sharma. Uh, sir, actually, uh, what I was saying about uh, living wills is that uh, living wills were part of the Supreme Court verdict in two thousand eighteen that was passed by the Supreme Court, and uh, the basic uh, thing that uh, needs to uh, uh, see living wills in India, uh, a person above the age of eighteen can make a living will. okay so he has to basically uh, go before the district magistrate along with a witness uh, uh, so as to uh, don't talk about the procedural aspects uh, uh, okay. can we call the next candidate because this part what is the legal position in india all of you should have been aware clearly because you are uh, in, i mean that's that's uh, what we are debating here yes yeah. what did the supreme what is the legal position in india this 2001 uh, 11 verdict and 2018 verdict what is the difference in between what happened one and second uh, the interpretation of article 21 right to life and right to live with human dignity and how the supreme court has interpreted it what are the conditions the supreme court has put they have talked about medical board which can take a call so uh, these are the things you should have been uh, thorough with you should have been aware Thank you so much, sir. Feels uh, it feels so fortunate to have you here today. Um, to proceed, um, I'd call upon Nitya Vaidya from the team Pragmatics to speak against the motion. Um. Okay. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Oh, you can tell me when to start. Okay. Start. You. You may start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nitya Vaidya, and I'll be going against the motion. Euthanasia is the painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease or an irreversible coma. 
in theory it seems like a reliable solution to pointless suffering but upon digging deeper into the fine print and psychology of a patient who might choose euthanasia it becomes evident that this is not all that it promises to be euthanasia is said to be free and voluntary purely upon the person who is undergoing unimaginable suffering but is this person really competent to make such a decision Researcher at the Baylor University of Medical Center state depression affects 77% of people with terminal illness. We have to ask ourselves if these symptoms were taken care of would the person still feel the same way? These voluntary cases of euthanasia may not even be voluntary. In a country like India where 56.1% of the elderly report to suffer from elder abuse it is not just possible but highly probable that the elderly suffering from terminal illness may be forced or emotionally blackmailed into choosing to end their own life so as to not be a burden on their own children today we have the most remarkable methods of hospice care catering to almost every symptom of terminal illness it has been proven that terminally ill patients with these methods may grow to appreciate the life that they have left however in countries where euthanasia is legal the quality of hospice care offered is not well developed because there is no need for it to be hence euthanasia seems nothing more than a cop out an excuse not to provide the patient with the highest quality of care to better their current state In India even without the legalization of euthanasia the number of terminally ill patients receiving palliative care is low we must first begin to make sure that each and every patient receives palliative and hospice care before we can even talk about legalizing euthanasia supporting euthanasia simply because society does not have place or does not want to make place for the for the differently abled is immoral and unjust The arguments led in support of euthanasia are almost always carefully picked cases wherein hospice care has either failed or is not applicable. We must remember that these laws are made for all and exceptions are made for some. A blanket law which is applicable to all is a, is a dangerous decision which can be easily misused. In taking a stance as doctors we must remember our oath to do no harm. Our job is to provide and care for the sick. We are not gods. we don't claim to be gods and we must not play god in the deci- the decision of death is not ours to take but the responsibility of health is ours to take thank you thank you nitya uh, so would you like to ask something so proceeding further um I'll just one call... second just nitya uh, uh, okay. you are against euthanasia yes yes uh, so uh, what do you the the in your conception what is the importance mm-hmm. of that kind of life where somebody is simply uh, on the bed in a vegetative state for maybe for in some cases for years like in arno sonborg case she was uh, had ridden for 42 years what is the purpose of having this kind of life prolonging somebody's agony knowing fully well that the person is not going to uh, to be resurrected so the purpose I, of I, the I, life just, just one sec i'm just uh, do you think morally uh, it is isn't it reprehensible to prolong somebody's agony as a doctor i am asking you is it go uh, will mm-hmm. it go against uh, uh, medical ethics thank you for your question sir um so this is a very tricky situation which has a lot of points that has to be taken into consideration but we must always remember our job as doctors is not to decide who lives and who dies but our job of doctors is to help to I'm better just, the I'm quality just, uh, of a person's for life clarity or better the quality yes sir for clarity sake i'm just letting you know you are not mm-hmm. deciding decision yeah. is being taken either by the patient in advance in the form of mm-hmm. living will or mm-hmm. uh, his or her family members are taking decision you will be implementing the decision so it's like yes. uh, uh, so you are not taking the decision so don't suffer the guilt of having taken such a decision you are not taking the decision 
so i agree that i'm not the one who would be taking the decision but you have to consider that even to even for a family member to take the decision is an incredibly emotional one or even a person before such a situation happens to them because they are not in that situation to begin with so how can so so initially to take the consideration of a living will or a person taking such a decision before they are in that state it very often happens that when a terminal illness is inflicted onto us Uh, it has like happened many times in the past that your whole perspective on life will completely change and you will grow to enjoy whatever little bit of life you have left or to take into a consideration of a person with a, in a vegetative state now as i said I, i spoke about blanket laws in my speech where i said that if you have a blanket law which is applicable to everyone where do you draw the line where do you say that this person is in a vegetative state and hence it is okay but this person is not so so like once you take the decision to legalize euthanasia for all for everyone who is terminal that line will keep on extending so i do not think while it might um prolonging the suffering of this one patient you have to consider a law for the entire country so which is why i'm against in asia because while in a particular case if it is necessary but is it necessary for all is the um stance that i would like to take thank you okay um thank you so much sir once again um uh i'd call upon janmejay singh from the team opinionatives for rebuttal hello everyone hello am i audible yes yes you are okay first of all uh now i'm like to appreciate you on your uh, debate uh, um, my fellow medico and the question i'm asking is that ki uh, that that is a, you yourself said that it's an inhuman thing to uh, provide euthanasia service to anyone right but at the same time don't you think if someone is suffering enduring so much pain and with uh, even the most advanced medical techniques cannot help him to such an extent to relieve him of his suffering do you think it's as human inhuman for us to decide to let him suffer his pain let us suffer his pain every day against his will of ending his life it's um, isn't it as, as i said in my argument the... everyone yeah thank thank you for your question as i said in my argument everyone who supports euthanasia will always pick up out this point saying that what if this person is suffering from unimaginable pain and palliative care is not working in this condition because that is the whole premise of why a person would want to legalize euthanasia but i would like to counter that by saying that in india most people don't even receive that level of palliative care so when you talk about this idealistic scenario of a person having you know access to all the sorts of medications all all psychiatrists therapy cbt everything that's a very idealistic scenario which at the moment in india we do not have so when we talk about a law for the entirety of our country we have to make you have to we have to agree and accept that most people don't even have access to that so how can we legalize euthanasia when this idealistic scenario that you talk about where the where everything has been tried in every aspect and every avenue has been explored does not even exist at the moment for a majority of our population thank you okay thank you so much um now um, we have our next team super scrubs uh, firstly i'd like to call upon kartavya singh for uh, to speak for the motion hello um, am i audible yes yes kartavya you are okay so can i start yes you can start we don't let animals suffer so why humans these were the words of one of the greatest minds on the planet dr stephen hawkins during one of his interviews when questioned about euthanasia unfortunately we lost him a couple of years ago owing to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or als which is a kind of neurodegenerative disorder while i presume that all of you present here must be aware of this fact what you might not know is that over walking 6 million people die every year because of such terminal ill diseases we're not going to even present here today and i'm going i'm going to convince you all that why euthanasia is essential yes you heard that right over 6 million souls each year undergo life changing transformations where they suffer a lifetime with no support of family or friends they leave behind their lifelong achievements prevailing to 
the never ending battle with diseases or should i sadly say that a battle which actually might end up with their demise yet even after such tribulations they do not get to choose to end their lives with dignity countries and governments worldwide have been weighing the pros and cons of legalizing euthanasia while innocent patients still continue to suffer belgium and netherlands had legalized euthanasia in the late 90s and they certainly have been benefited by it statistically speaking in the past 15 to 20 years the current status there is that nearly 15 to 20% of the patients on the donors list today in belgium are being saved by the organs of euthanized individuals there are people worldwide supporting the legalization of practice of good death majority of these petitions are being filed by sufferers or family members who actually face the financial and the emotional stress but even more so it is about the dignity and personal attributes of the patients which actually face the blunt of stigma studies conducted in australia have shown that majority of the patients feel that the loss of right to autonomy and lack of the control over their own life disturbs them more than the actual pain and suffering from the disease well this is true because they know that even if they were to stay alive their lives would never be the same as before the society doesn't accept them they just considered as a physically and mentally weak remnant of their past selves the pragmatic arguments state that many of the practices used in end of life care currently are essentially type of euthanasia in all but me for example there are practices making of making a dna dnars or do not attempt resuscitation or the palliative sedation techniques all of which are kind of form of euthanasia so what's the point of actually practicing it but legally putting this issue under the carpet to wrap up the argument i would like to say that it would be a good time to consider that when nearly a million people every year give away their lives in name of suicide which is very much legal by the way in most of the parts of the world then why is euthanasia still being considered as an act of immoral conduct why does our hypocrisy cloud our judgment to see the truth and actually sympathize with the patients itself thank you now i just want to i just want to so kartavya are you saying are you saying that euthanasia and suicide are almost pretty similar i think they are very different no and, sir uh, uh, no sir i wasn't no, no, saying no, no, that no 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 and sir. just one minute just one minute. just one minute uh, why would you want to bring suicide at all into this isn't that something completely sir uh, my point of bringing suicide here no sir my point of bringing suicide here is that uh, every year over a million of pe- million people they are committing suicide and because of um, because of various various kinds of reasons like be it mental stress or something of the other sort but that is considered as a le- as legal but here we are talking about a patient who's been suffering for past so many years because of uh, because of and chronically ill disease and yet we do not give him and his own own so sir how is that illegal no uh, i mean you are you telling me that suicide is legal is a bit uh, uh, it's difficult to digest for me purely because suicide is a decision somebody takes uh, in whatever circumstances that doesn't mean that suicide is legal so let's let's sir, get the law according yeah. to the law lawfully it is like the act of uh, uh, active suicide it is legal but passive suicide like if it is aided by someone else that is illegal but the act of active suicide that a person himself uh, takes away his life that is considered legal so how is that justified kartavi i think you are you are mis uh, understanding yeah. suicide is decriminalized doesn't mean that suicide is legal i mean those are yeah. two different terms in the sense you can't be uh, you know you the police can't take you to court for attempting suicide but that doesn't mean that suicide is a sir, legal act sir it is yet to be legalized different. it is yeah, yet yeah. to be decriminalized and yeah as yeah. on date in it's the, a crime that, failed suicide is a crime under section yes, a failed suicide is a crime yes anything you would like to add sir no failed suicide is a crime and somebody uh, helping the person in the process 
he or she also becomes uh, it's very uh, much a crime. an accomplice in the yeah. crime and that also is punishable under uh, indian penal code so uh, section 206 yes, sir. Uh, but my yes sir uh, sir hello yeah carry on yeah sir uh, my point of argument here was that if a person is taking their own lives uh, like by committing suicide be because be due to n number of reasons whatever so be the reason so why is that okay that's decriminalized no problem no issues with that but when it comes to legalizing or uh, allowing such chronically ill patients to uh, give them to give them their own life well, uh, i have problems in getting uh, is there Uh, uh, I'm asking fellow uh, judges. Yes, yes, sir. No, I, I he has a network problem. He has a network problem. Yes. So it's difficult to uh, listen to you, care. Uh, voice That's is cracking. That's why we have a network. Your voice is cracking. I if think we has... should just uh, carry on with the next. Yeah, one. he has a yeah. he has a rebuttal as well. So I think yeah. we might have to wait for it. Hello, What's his sir. Am I audible? hello yes you are audible yes sir yes okay so uh, sir so should i repeat my point hello i think uh-huh. we should go ahead with the rebuttal yes okay sir okay we'll proceed for the rebuttal um i'd call jigyasa bansal from the team tactical uh-huh. trains yes, uh, yes am jigyasa, i audible yes uh, yes jigyasa is it right okay uh, uh i would like to ask you just one thing that you said that it is, for people it is more disturbing to have a life lo- uh, with with loss of dignity than to have uh, a life with with a physical pain and physical distress and that is why they are opting for euthanasia i want to ask you that why are we moving on to such extremes of uh, euthanasia and ending someone's life when we can actually work up on the solutions for uh, where we can actually uh, treat patient uh, mentally and uh, just just providing them uh, palliative care would do the things then we are moving towards uh, such a, uh, such um, extreme uh, causes when actually it is not needed okay uh, uh, we were we are, what what are we saying that pain uh, is the basic reason and the physical distress is basic reason behind the people opting for euthanasia but it is actually not as you only mentioned that depression and the mental uh, um, feeling of men, uh, being a burden over the family is basic reasons why people are uh, seeking euthanasia so why are we working on some solutions uh, where we can actually work up uh, these uh, these things so that patient doesn't feel a burden over over his family rather than opting for uh, options like euthanasia where where it can be easily misused over uh, in a society yes sir your question cannot be longer than your speech ah okay okay sorry sir can i answer that no yes yes you you uh, yeah. proceed so basically jigyasa yes, coming to your point my uh, coming to my point actually was that um agree that most of the studies show that depression and all the life of the, that the loss of dignity is the main reason why patients end their life but the thing is even if they are under such a uh, mental rehab centers or any kind of rehabilitation to to stop this uh, how who gets to decide that when will the actual cure to their disorder uh, be achieved like even though there are many advances yet there is no end to uh, many of the diseases present today and secondly after uh, even if they get cured after that their lives would completely change like they won't be because of the current stigma and all of the way uh, our society works people wouldn't see them as they used to be before Are you done, Karthavya? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call upon Chanika Desh Pandey from the team Super Scrubs to speak against the motion. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Chanika. Okay. Uh. Yes, yeah, yeah. Start. Okay. 
the topic of euthanasia is one that's been debated for decades now so i'm going to ask you to let go of all your preconceived notions about euthanasia and just hear me very practically explain to you my approach of believing that euthanasia should not be legalized allow me to say this very bluntly but legalizing euthanasia is nothing but a cheaper alternative to medical care describing killing as health care is stretching the definition of health care way beyond what a reasonable person should accept asking doctors to violate the international code of medical ethics and abandon their obligation to preserve and respect human life will make the patients distrustful of the doctor's intentions they may even think that the doctor will simply kill them off because we made that option available by legalizing euthanasia if we normalize ending our lives early authoritatively legitimizing the idea that there is no path to improvement pessimism will spread in the society it will reduce our motivation and interest to find a cure to the incurable disease of the patient no research will ever be carried out regarding such diseases and will be caught in a vicious cycle just killing off the patients suffering from diseases that we don't have much idea about euthanasia will become a routinely suggested treatment option for such diseases for a moment even if we believe that euthanasia can be legalized we'll need a specific classification for the people who will qualify as being eligible to kill themselves think about the message that we are sending to the already vulnerable people we are telling them that we think your condition is bad enough and that you should consider killing yourself we might use fancy words like relieving yourself of the pain or dying with dignity but in reality it is ultimately and absolutely killing yourself this would mean that we are classifying people as being less worthy of life but way in the major ऑडियो क्वालिटी विल इम्प्रूव रिपीट योर लास्ट स्टेटमेंट Okay. Audio clear. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'll repeat my last point again. Uh for a moment even if we believe that euthanasia can be legalized, we'll need a specific classification for people who will qualify as being eligible to kill themselves. Think about the message we are sending to the already vulnerable people. We think that your condition is bad enough and that you should consider killing yourself. we might want to use fancy words like relieving yourself of the pain or dying with dignity but in reality it is ultimately killing yourself this would mean that we are classifying people as being less worthy of life but wait isn't that a major human rights violation and mind you it does not end here the patient who finally decides to take his or her life would then be required to write a formal application to the legal authorities which will take the decision for the person granting or denying him the permission to take his own life does that make us all equals in the society and what if they are denied this right i'll tell you what's going to happen next people with disabilities will be viewed as inferior downgrading their lives as humans even while they are alive justifying all of this by simply saying the law says that you should be dead or raising questions like why are you still alive finally once the word spreads around society won't lift these people up instead it will push them further down into the spiral of getting euthanized moreover families who don't decide to take the option of euthanasia will be bad marked and insulted for supposedly wasting the country's resources whatever procedures it may allow the true essence and intent of euthanasia remains to end someone's life but wait isn't it the same as committing a murder that's it from my side thank you Thank you so much, Jaya sir. Jaya sir, um, just uh, can I ask a small question? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Sanika. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's Sanika. Yeah, Sanika. Oh, Sanika, this. My point. fault. My fault, sir. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, Sanika, uh, you talked about uh, murder. Yes. Do you know what what is murder? Yes, sir. I know. I I knew. Can't hear you. 
mm, not audible i might do the sound very hmm uh, just one second not audible my audible now uh, yeah it's much better okay okay so yeah uh, sir yes i would like to say that i knew that this would this, this would raise a question certainly and uh, basically i know it would have sounded very insensitive of me to compare a murder with um, active euthanasia i know but the point that i wanted to bring forth was that um, we should consider the core and the intent of this action the action of active euthanasia and again you are gone you are not audible it better now and network mm. but is it better no again uh, it's still disturbed am i audible now sir it's better okay so um what i meant to say was that um the basic problem is um, i mean i know it would have sounded very insensitive of me to compare something as grave as a murder to the act of active euthanasia but basically i meant that we should consider the core and the intent of committing this action or going forward or going ahead with this action of active euthanasia ultimately there is a reason why active euthanasia is illegal and still passive one is allowed so i just meant to say that uh, euthanasia should not be the first option on our list and uh, ultimately it is it means or it points towards taking or ending somebody's life and that is something that i don't agree with so i will stick to my stance thank you and that's what i had to say thank you um okay so thanks anika and thank you so much sir um i'd call somya bharti from the team tactical twins for the rebuttal uh hello sarika my question for you is that you mentioned that doctors would be compared to killers in the instance where the the doctors prescribe euthanasia to this patient who is suffering from a terminal illness so that i find is a very baseless argument because it's not that the doctor would go and then just uh, plug off the life support system because it is a very a uh, well systematic way in which euthanasia is carried out there are judicial magistrates there is a medical board which sits uh, which which sits uh, and then uh, the decision of euthanasia is taken so that was a, a particularly an argument which i found pretty baseless then i would also like to throw light upon the fact that in our country where so many people are dying because of lack of healthcare and because of lack of quality of it and then there's a, there's an individual who's in a uh, terminally veg vegetative state or who's brain dead and the government is spending so much money on this person whose family is wanting this person that they should be uh, they should be given death without pain and this they, this pain and suffering of them should be ended so don't you think even if you look at it from a financial uh, aspect it would be rather prudent that if we shift the finances of the government towards those who might come up with better outcomes if the, if that amount of money is spent on them Okay thank you Soumya I appreciate your question but let me just clarify myself what I mentioned in my debate was not I was not comparing doctors to killers what I was trying to bring forth was that um doctors are not like okay even if a uh, doctor as you mentioned that there is a very systematic procedure when euthanasia is conducted but the only point with regard to doctors that I was we need basically uh, that um we have lost you i was trying to yeah i was trying to say that the um if hello yeah i was trying to say that if if the um if if a person is suffering from a particular disease and we know that euthanasia is an option and that euthanasia has been conducted previously in the same patient suffering from the same diseases so then when another patient would come to the doctor then it would 
not uh, you know the patient would not be very satisfied or very uh, you know he would not trust the patient with respect to uh, the fact that the doctor is you know is going to try his or her best to provide me that treatment and here my basic point and my basic understanding is that we should not be considering only one patient who is suffering from the disease and who is in front of us but we should also consider the impact that euthanizing that patient will have on millions of similar people who will be suffering from the same disease and i think that should satisfy your query thank you okay um thank you so much now i'd call uh, soumya bharti from the team tactical twins to speak for the motion good evening everybody forced to accept this sad situation for 28 years 4 months and some days a life without freedom is not a life only time and the evolution of conscious consciousness will decide one day if my request was reasonable or not the aforementioned lines by the protagonist of the movie the sea inside dealing with the true story of a quadriplegic and his 30 year battle for the legal rights to end his own life but to light the fact that forcing people to suffer against their will doesn't abide by the hippocratic oath but rather is cruel and a downright negation to human rights and dignity The word euthanasia has its origin from two Greek words, eu meaning good and thanatos meaning death, pointing to promotion of painless death over painful existence. Speaking for the motion, I would split my arguments in a triplet. Firstly, for the terminally ill, euthanasia can come in as an aid. Firstly, for the terminally ill, euthanasia can come in as an aid to end their mammoth of pain and suffering. the opposing would definitely argue that passing such a law may be fueling mal practices in the sense that the death and kin of the deceased might coerce him or her into signing a legal will or the doctors might uh, misuse it by terminating the treatments of critically ill patients who are not able to afford the care mm -hmm. but any individual freedom offered to the masses comes with risk of abuse and such risks can be minimized by observing proper legal standards just a uh, cancelling a cancelling cancelling a right merely because the risk of abuse of a right exists is no reason to deny the person the right itself secondly let me throw light on the fact that in our country around 16 lakh people die annually due to lack of healthcare services and poor quality of the same and on patients who would rather prefer less aggressive treatments or on whom the treatment would just prolong their suffering existence rather than posing an improvement in such scenarios voluntary euthanasia can not only let this person die with dignity but also shift the finances towards those who might promise better outcomes My third argument points at the fundamental right of an individual to decide what ought to be done with his or her own life Euthanasia respects the individual's right to self-determination or right to privacy. Interference with that right can only be justified if it's to protect essential social values, which is definitely not the case where patients suffering unbearably at the end of their lives request euthanasia where no alternatives exist. I would conclude by saying that the purpose of legalizing euthanasia is not to impose it. the option of choosing palliative and hospice care would always coexist with euthanasia as just a third option if the misery is unendurable for the individual with proper legal safeguards and guidelines euthanasia can prove to be an effective tool to put an end to less tribulations thank you thank you so much somya um now I'd um I'd request Sanika Deshpande from Team Super Scrubs for rebuttal. Yes, hi Somya. So my question to you that um you mentioned first, your voice is not at all clear. All one. Yeah, it's not clear. I would like to say. Okay. I think uh, if will it be okay if we can ask her to type her question in the chat yeah, why, box? Why don't you, Why don't you just put it in the chat box? You save time. Okay, let me let me do that. Is it confirmed for me one last time, please? It will 
who's audible now okay okay so uh, i wanted to ask you that you mentioned that hospice and palliative care should be the third option along with euthanasia but why not the first option why should euthanasia or killing somebody be the first option on our list why should we not exhaust all other options before jumping to such a grave uh, you know solution such as euthanasia because as a future doctor i believe that our uh, you know our field of work is greatly based on hope for the future if we don't have a solution to a disease or a cure to a disease today we might have it tomorrow or the next day or the next year so why should euthanasia be first on your list and why not hospice and palliative care should be first because okay. that's what you mentioned in your speech that it should be the third option that is why i'm just i would like some clarification on this somya thank you okay so thank you for your question firstly i would like to correct you on the fact that i mentioned euthanasia as the third option and uh, definitely hospice and palliative care would coexist also i would like to point out the fact that legalizing euthanasia as i mentioned in my speech doesn't mean that you have to impose it if a person is there with uh, in a terminally vegetative state or is not responding to the treatment so it's not that the doctor would go and remove the life support system is just an option if the family agrees with it or if the patient feels that he or she is undergoing so much pain and that pain is not bearable for that individual or the family feels that it is putting financial burden over them to spending on someone who is in a vegetative state so if the consent is there then you can go to euthanasia but it's not that if the law of euthanasia comes anybody who goes in a system vegetative state or is not responding to a uh, uh, hospice care the doctors would go and perform euthanasia on that person it's just an option so uh, i guess that answers your question but yes then that is the thing right the major concern is that uh, first you know first we legalize voluntary euthanasia and then slowly and gradually it might become yeah. that okay, okay anyway sorry, i would not like no to cross question yes. Yes. yes yes yeah uh, can i ask one question Yes, sure, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Just, uh, just uh, you mentioned about right to privacy and uh, right to self determination. How far uh, these two rights can be extended? Can it be taken to the extent of taking one's own life? I am not talking about uh, suicide. I am talking in terms of uh, euthanasia. so the idea of euthanasia is still right now under development and i i support the idea which is uh, there which is prevalent in india that a person who is no i'm just my question is very precise my question is how far the right to privacy and right to self determination these two expressions used how far these two can be extended or expanded or stretched can it be stretched to the extent that it uh, uh, goes up to euthanasia so if the if the person feels that the pain he or she is going through is undurable or if the person feels that the life he is living he is not satisfied that that with that kind of life and he would rather choose death over it so definitely the laws and the legal uh, the legal structure of our country can't force that person to continue living a life of that sort because the person when he, he is in vegetative state he is not in a position to take a decision somebody else is taking decision that person is not you i am trying to draw a distinction between self determination and right to privacy of that person in that case that person alone can take the decision here the person has gone into vegetative state persistent vegetative state so somebody else is taking decision so there is a distinction between self determination and somebody else determining things for me or in that in this case for the patient Uh, yes sir so if the patient had a written living will prior to that condition so definitely that would come under this case of self determination um uh, other than that then definitely the team of doctors would be under consultation that the person has gone in a comatose condition which is too bad and there is no chance of resuscitation and the patient is uh, burdening the family with the the price of his treatment so i guess then you are again moving away from the core arguments you made self determination and right to privacy you are saying the family members can take a decision thank you okay um thank you so much sir 
um now i'd call uh, jikyasa bansal from tactical twins to speak against the motion okay uh, am i visible and audible yes both yes 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 uh, okay 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 let reason hold the reins a concept as logically fragile and blatantly emotional as euthanasia in my opinion can only be written poems on and not the laws as long as we do not have a system ensuring us the chastity of intentions of all the stakeholders and quantification of the said means advocating my views against the motion i want to draw your attention towards one serious moral question which legalization of euthanasia would raise and that is of validity of intentions behind it a times of in your report says that of all the cases filed in the family courts 66% are property related now suspecting monetary gain as a potent propellant fueling one the argument of family members and two pressure imposed over the ailing behind his documented consent wouldn't be far fetched hence the danger of misuse looms large over authentication of such a consent but what about the painful existence patient is forced to endure i may be asked my worthy opponents here's another set of facts for you then a study published by national center for biotechnology has revealed tiredness and confusion as the leading symptoms experienced by icu patients were at high risk of death and surprisingly not some untreatable entity as pain also statistics from oregon a state of usa with legalized euthanasia has pointed out loss of dignity and fear of burning others as primary reasons given by the patients opting for euthanasia and not their ailing conditions per se studies have also shown that if pain and depression are adequately treated in a dying person as they would be in a suicidal non dying person the desire to commit suicide evaporates depression family conflict feeling of abandonment and hopelessness lead to suicide regardless of one's physical condition my point is when physical distress is not as strong a basis as is being amplified why to promote suicide or for that matter a potential homicide why are we focusing on dealing with the causes that are making the patient choose immediate death over a stay legalizing euthanasia will eventually legalizing one one kind of euthanasia will eventually pave way for involuntary and non voluntary euthanasia as can be cited in the example of netherlands where people with mental illness have applied for it do you think allowing someone to die just because they are terminally agitated with life at that point of time is a responsible act and not mere careless handling of someone's life to life rather than putting the suffering individual on an edge where he loathes his own existence we should let them have their last breaths in the arms of best of palliative care that our affection can provide i think we need to understand that peaceful exit isn't subject to time of its arrival it is the outcome of time spent loving and being loved back let nature hold the reins thank you that was all thank you jigyasa uh, she was a last speaker for today now i'd like to call on uh, the person from team scrubs to do the rebuttal for jigyasa um hello am i audible yes, yes karta we are audible okay um, so to guess so first of all there was this uh, point where you said that the most common presenting symptoms are so if we go by your facts so basically most of the diseases have a most common presenting symptom of fever so that does not even come close to put that how sorry your voice is cracking uh, i cannot hear you man hello uh, your voice is cracking yeah please repeat okay okay sorry so yeah uh, there was this there was this place in your speech when you said that the most common presenting symptom are so and so so for that i'd like to say that for the majority of the diseases nowadays the most common presenting symptom is fever and that no way in loan can uh, ever let you know or like portray that what is the extent of the disease or how much the patient will be suffering right so secondly and uh, coming to my question um, the doctor patient relationship is a great relationship is a beautiful relationship basically in our medical community so how would you in your right mind say, nick uh, 
tell a patient that you that a patient who whom you've been treating for past so many years and you know he she has been suffering how would you morally uh, reply to him or like convince him to basically tell him that no death is not an option to cure you of your uh, pain when you know that there is no end to it when you know that there is no cure to it in any in any near future see my point is deciding uh, you are done no i can answer that yeah 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 ha okay uh, i just want to say that it is very uh, uh, th- there are conditions where where euthanasia can be applied but legalizing it would be applying it to all and then the need of palliative care and hospices would subside and people will be opting for euthanasia as an option and it would be misused so my point is we cannot uh, just we should not uh, legalize a law that can uh, be misused by the people out there when we can have other options uh, with us and as the statistics are suggesting um, uh, the conditions of the ailing the, the the ones who are terminally ill are not um, so unbearable that they are opting for euthanasia it is because of some uh, mental pressure the societal pressure that we are putting them under which is making them opt for euthanasia so when we can combat those uh, things without uh, without taking such an extreme step so why are we going after that where, where uh, we uh, actually we are providing a toolkit in the hands of those who can easily misuse it are you done jikasha ha ah, yes yes okay so anything you'd like to ask so would you like to ask anything dr dasiman not well uh, you are against jigyasa uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you are against uh, uh, euthanasia. Yeah. Just tell me. Uh, I, I have been uh, after watching everything. Uh, I many a time, uh, what you people have argued, it's you don't tend to go beyond uh, a medical thing, and uh, even the legal aspect is not touched upon properly. i am afraid the, the entire uh, issue it involves uh, medical profession the ethics it involves certain aspects of religion and culture it involves psychology it involves law it involves uh, so many uh, morality so there are aspects which you have completely left i am not just talking about you many of you so i'm just requesting you uh, one of you will go for the world round so one of means one of the teams so you should be preparing yourself on all the aspects there are because uh, there are many uh, you will find that some of the judges particularly they are from the western world and uh, following christian traditions they are thoroughly pro life so you will be uh, asked questions which you may not have expected so you should be prepared f- to answer questions that touch upon uh, religion uh, maybe culture maybe morality maybe ethics so uh, religion culture morality ethics and medicine of course so it's not just a medical issue so be prepared for rest of the aspects which uh, uh, maybe Uh, you will be asked lots of questions not by uh, the judges not just by the judges but also by uh, other contesting teams no okay so okay thank you thank you thank you so uh, much sir yeah overall i just want to i just want to comment that i think even technical terms should not be used for just for the sake of debate things like murder things like suicide because when we are talking about law i mean you are i mean what we are debating about you have to get your technicalities right because ultimately yes. ultimately you are not talking something very loosely it's not about presenting it well because this is an important issue we are we are debating about it not just for the sake of it because it's it's a, actually 2018 was pretty much a big step 
to in going towards euthanasia so we from the of course from the other generation we are obviously trying to the next generation we are obviously trying to see where we can go into whether it's going to actually become active euthanasia or so so don't lose these technical terms loosely on the platform because then uh, it would just mean uh, i mean just defeating the purpose of having the debate yeah ma- just to substantiate what you said uh, uh, dr nasiman uh, the expression self determination and right to privacy the moment you mention right to privacy they will drag you to somebody can drag you to the entire supreme court uh, constitution bench verdict and can that verdict be used to justify uh, this kind of a step which uh, somebody would say it's an extreme step so uh, be careful while using any technical terms which maybe sometimes it could be relating to medical science sometimes it could be uh, law so because the moment you use that you can be caught unaware because uh, somebody would be expert on that subject uh, uh, alka ma'am can we have comments from you no uh, ma'am please unmute yourself yes Uh, i think i would just like to echo the sentiments that uh, people have put in a lot of hard work and we enjoyed listening to what you have said and the uh, i i think we need to look as uh, mr satyaprakash has said into the totality of the whole issue and we have to accept that this is such a big issue that we cannot really come to a conclusion just based on yes. arguments however we need to have a 360 degree view of the issue and as doctors we always put a medical slant to it so i really do appreciate uh, mr prakash's uh, views that we need to be more um, uh, holistic in our approach to this thank you very much students for a very hard work and enjoyed listening to what you said thank you i, I must add because i pointed out certain shortcomings rest uh, all of you have uh, presented your views quite well so pretty uh-huh. well you are it seems you are professional debaters yeah absolutely and i would i would like to say you have actually put a lot of thought process in us as well so uh, we as professionals yeah. would even think in a different way and try to approach the entire thing which which is why we debate to be very frank the human mind wants to debate so that we can think of solutions and give it a better thought so thanks a lot and i would uh, i would congratulate iit student chapter as well to actually get it done because ultimately uh, we need platforms like this where people can express themselves and make people think because that's the that's the point of actually uh, being a human being so thank you thanks a lot and i i didn't know uh, that uh, even medical students they are so articulate i am uh, i used to i'm used to judging uh, uh, debates and uh, moot court competitions but medical of of course law students but medical students uh, are that articulate for me it's a sort of revelation thank thank you so much sir it really means a lot for us um now proceeding further um i i first Only of all i'd like to com- uh, comments from dr anand khan so um shreya we could have dr anand khan's comments he's been silent yeah, for sure. more just realize that he's been Sh- listening Sh- uh, with intent but has been quite silent sure we'd love yeah, to sure. hear you from hear from you sir sure, sure. thank you so much um, apologies i didn't want to intervene because i had construction happening at home so i didn't want to add to the cacophony uh, but i very much enjoyed the um, the conversations i think that, you know you all did great uh, it's always difficult to deal with an issue like this which is uh, emotionally challenging there are legal aspects to it there are ethical aspects to it there are also two sides i'm sure all of you are debating within yourselves while you're putting in your opinion and but you sort of took one side and did it well so you know i think a learning process for all of us uh, and congratulations to the team which organized but also to all of you for uh, for st- uh, speaking forth uh, you know just maybe some tips from my perspective as i was listening in one i would tend to think that uh, think through when you present evidence that it's nice to sort of talk about international evidence but i think what really is nice is to bring in the indian perspective and that was uh, not there in m- many presentations you know you talked about a lot of international literature but didn't seem to look at some of the indian evidence and i think there were some questions also from the judges specifically around what the indian situation is and there's quite a bit written so i think while it's nice to quote media reports maybe also look at uh, indian medical writing on this issue and there's been a whole, whole lot of work which has happened you know ashish himself for example has organized a lot of discussions now it's almost 6 6 7 8 years ago 
uh, and there's been work uh, due to the petitions which have been ongoing. So it'll be nice to maybe also look at the local in scenario when you're presenting because that sort of always gives a nice balance. The second thing um, I think which would, would be nice to talk about is when you look at uh, issues like advanced directives, then also look at what other legal precedents um, are there. Uh, so the Mental Health Care Act, which is a relatively recent act of 2017, is a good place to look at because it really deals with the issue of advanced directives. And it's on, it's among the very few very progressive health legislations that we have. In fact, uh, you know, this whole issue around um, suicide also is dealt in Section 115 of the Mental Health Care Act. And Section 309 of the IPC, which criminalizes suicide, for example, um, is a colonial act. And uh, there's been a lot of debate about changing it, but obviously not a lot has changed. But the Mental Health Care Act has at least tried to make an effort to bring about change. So uh, it'd be nice to for, for, for you to also delve into those aspects and then say what's worked in the mental health care field. Why can uh, some of that not be extended? The other issue which I found a bit missing was that, yes, there's a Supreme Court judgment, but then what is the problem? Uh, the problem is one of implementation. We have a judgment which is very difficult to implement. I think you know there's not been even one probably case which has gone to a review board uh, because it's really, really challenging in the way it's written uh, by the honorable judges that uh, we want to implement it through a, a whole establishment of a process which uh, from a practical perspective is not really feasible. So I don't think that we've really had any scenario even though the judgment is now almost two, two and a half, three years probably old uh, where these kind of boards have been set up. Um, I, so the other aspect I think which I didn't hear much discussion was uh, around quality of life. I think it's one thing to say that life is important, death is important, choices are important, but what about the quality of life and why should that be important? I think now there's global recognition of quality of life as an important metric. So how do we situate that in our um, arguments would have been nice to see. Um, so overall, but great job by all of you. My best wishes. Um, I think these are important debates, I think, for all of us to have with our friends, with our colleagues, in our medical institutions, because, you know, change will only happen when we look at these in detail. And uh, best wishes also to the team, which will be going to the finals. Take care and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Any other, uh, anyone else from the audience, if they have comments, or thoughts to share on the debate or anything, they can, I think, uh, come on. Uh, so maybe one more point uh, or a couple of points that I would like to add on this uh, is that one, I am not aware in the last 25 years of my um, undergrad and postgrad days of any debate which offers almost $2,500 cash prize in money for undergraduate students. I have not heard of any, I have not seen any. So $2,500 is big prize money, but whichever team represents India Please remember, you're not fighting for that $2,500. You are fighting for your country and you're representing your country. So be prepared, not only with the content and presentation, but be prepared for anything. There are countries like Japan, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, uh, Egypt, which are going to compete and uh, it's, it's you're competing for your country. So be prepared, at least with the Indian position and definitely as a holistic view on euthanasia. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate all the participants because not the victory, but the participation matters. Not destination, but the journey matters. Not the success, but the struggle matters. While the, uh, while the scores of the competition are being compiled, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the students chapter of Indian Academy of Geriatrics. Um, sir, could you, um, respected jury, could you please send the score sheets to us um, till the time? You want to announce it right now? Uh, no, no, um, uh, I'll continue with... Uh, because I I would uh, in I would like to be freed 
because i have a deadline to meet by 9 i am supposed to send something somewhere so yeah so they will they will just compile the results like and announce so, uh, them so uh, can i come back after 9 if you allow me because i am supposed to write something and send it by 9 so i thought i will be yeah. free by 7 it's uh, quarter to 8 by so nine, we will hold will... back on the results we will not immediately, announce the results immediately after immediately after 9 i'll just uh, i have written down on separate sheet so i have to download that sheet and then put it on that sure so we will we will okay. announce the results later i have uh, i have everything on my notebook okay so okay. i have to put it on the uh, sheet that i will da- download and then i'll send it across okay sure yep. sir we will announce the results later uh, so if uh, uh, if you allow me can i uh, leave yes 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 please uh, thank oh, you sir okay. and Thanks. because uh, i was told last evening only so uh, please thank you no we are grateful that you joined even at the 11th hour no because i have the apologies from our side no i have a deadline to meet otherwise uh, i would have left yep, sure thank you thank yeah. you thank, thank you so thank much sir thank you so we will just hold back on the results and we will announce the results uh, once we have the compiled sheets from everyone all of the judges and um, if there is anyone from the audience or any other uh, presenter who wants to share their thoughts they are welcome otherwise we can close the session okay any of the presenters want to say something about the entire experience and please feel free to leave we are already uh, i mean past our time so i can't hold uh, anyone to further agony and misery so if any of the judges or any of the participants would like to uh, disappear from this please go ahead anyway we are not going to announce the results so you won't miss out on anything but any participant wants to speak something or express their own uh, feelings or their experiences while going through this please go ahead this is your time um i just wanted to say that i'm really thankful for this opportunity not just because i got here i got to be here and speak but also because i learned a lot of things about euthanasia in the past 2 3 weeks i learned a lot about euthanasia like um initially i was pro euthanasia but as i did more and more research i learned a lot of things a lot of reasons for which people can be against euthanasia as well so i'd like to thank the organizers for that Yeah, thank you, Vibha. But uh, the students and participants, please remember that your comments that you are making now will not impact your results. But thank you, thank you so much, Vibha. <laughs> Any you, other participant wants to share? Cool. So shall we call it a day? We will get back to you with the results. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, everyone, for uh, you. being on this you, meeting, sir. helping us thank with the judging. Everyone. And best thank of luck so to much. all of you. Best of luck to the best team that will represent India in the next round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Best wishes. Thank you, sir.